Hello folks, it's me, Regular Pat. I'm back with a video here. Today is the long-awaited Kingdom Hearts Hot Take Tournament. I guess it's more of a bracket, right? Oh, sure. Oh, Kiwi's here, by the way. Remember Kiwi from the uh, the character bracket over a year ago? I brought him back because he's my bracket guy. Yeah, I'm Everybody. more famously from the streams these days. It's true. That's my arena now. Kiwi does like to hop on at RegularPatYT at Twitch.tv. <laughs> Ooh, so. shameless plug. Yeah, look at that. We love that. We love that. <laughs> Great. Um, so... For those of you who are unaware or unacquainted with the channel, I recently ran a survey um, both on my Twitter, on YouTube, um, really anywhere that you can get a link from me, um, and I asked for everyone's hottest Kingdom Hearts take, and we had 450 total responses. Um, I narrowed that down to about 84 takes or so, and then I pass it off to Kiwi. He narrowed it down to 32. If we do 64, we'll be here all day because we got some novels here. So the, the goal of, of the video today, of the bracket, is to pit these hot takes against each other and uh, gonna emerge from the end of the project with the hottest and most well-argued Kingdom Hearts take. And that's something that we have to kind of delineate here, right, Kiwi? When we're looking at the, the original batch of 450, there's takes in there that are either not hot or they are hot, but they're not argued very well. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for a balance. Basically, for me, I'm not even necessarily going to advance things that I think are that I agree with, but that I think are most well argued. I think a good take for me would be one that I don't see constantly on Twitter.com within the Kingdom Hearts fandom and something that also moves the needle for me because the person argued it well. So we're going to be pitting these against each other. They're seated, right Kiwi? You've seated this bracket because you have oh, to. Gotta have a seated bracket. You we gotta can't come out here with a seedless bracket. Right. It's not a watermelon, Patty. It's yeah, not a watermelon. Right, that's right. No seedless watermelons here. Yeah. And are they are they in like categories or conferences or is it kind of like story stuff versus gameplay stuff or like what kind of what, what should we expect here? They are in rough conferences. Okay. Most of the combat stuff is all in one thing. Some world design stuff, some of the mechanics, and then some story stuff. They're all in their own lane for the most part. Gotcha. Uh, there had to be some crossover because there just wasn't eight takes that kind of fit all right. into one box. So I was stretching the rules a bit on those conferences, but for the most part, most of the combat stuff will be against other combat takes. So Good, yes. like that. I like that, uh, that balance there. And what else do we have to cover? Oh, uh, not everybody had a name associated with their take here. So if it was your take and you didn't leave a name, that sounds like a you problem, and I apologize, but uh, not everybody left a name here. But maybe you wanted to be anonymous, because maybe you're about to, you know, be the, the shot heard around the world on the internet, and, uh, you know, Twitter might be blowing up in response to some of these spicy takes here. Um, also, there is a lot of, like, um, repetition, so, you know, you might hear a take that sounds similar to yours, and I just ended up going with the one that I felt was, you know, more um, substantially argued, um, or when it got passed off to Kiwi, he might have uh, made some cuts in that way. Um, but don't, don't feel bad, you're still being represented in spirit. And, you know, thank you for everybody who answered the survey. I appreciate the the huge turnout on that. And uh, your efforts did not go unnoticed, although a lot of them were deleted because <laughs> some people didn't understand the assignment. But, you know, 32 of you did. Um, and that's what we're here to talk about today. So why don't we just uh, get kicked off with the first round here? Um, what do we have going up against each other here, Kiwi? Yo, let's get started with a couple of scorchers. Here. Okay. <laughs> How's it sound? Yeah. Let's go. All right, so the first number one seed that we're going to be dealing with is, uh, it's a favorite of ours. Mm. We encounter it a lot. Yeah. Uh, Terra is not dumb. Oh, I'm so glad. I knew this would make it when I was reading through. There were a couple variations of this take, but this was uh, just flat out saying Terra's not dumb. It's like the, it's the most boring thing in the Kingdom Hearts fandom to hear how stupid Terra is. So I'm glad we have an argument to the contrary represented here. All right, what's that going up against? And that's going a uh, up against the number eight seed, light is not equal to darkness in Kingdom Hearts. Mm. Yeah, so that is something that uh, the series has kind of been trying to peddle to us. Or maybe this person's arguing that that's not what's being peddled to us. That uh, light is, in fact, superior or inferior. I guess we'll take a look at the take in depth. Um, but uh, I guess I'll read that Terra take, and then you can read the uh, light and darkness one. Sounds like a plan. Okay. This is from Anonymous, I'm not sure who this one is associated with, but it begins, Terra is actually not dumb, and is probably one of the smarter characters from Birth by Sleep, as well as being a better person and friend than his other two friends. People believe that Terra does things and thinks later, but that describes the others more than him, and we see other characters do things that make a lot less sense than the things he does. Aqua runs into the stepmother and sisters from Cinderella and immediately resorts to violence before she had to be stopped by the fairy godmother. 
Ventus does something similar with the dwarves. Then there's the time Aqua told Xehanort where Ventus was after his voice had clearly changed back from Terra in 0.2. He is also a more understanding and better friend. Aqua and Ven both start to believe Maleficent's story about him stealing Aurora's heart, trusting the word of a complete stranger over one of their best friends without even asking for his explanation, when all they have is Maleficent's word. Even comparing him to Cage one Riku, when Maleficent goaded him into believing Sora didn't care about him because he had Nalm and Goofy, he stayed salty for the whole game. But after the fight the BBS trio have in Radiant Garden, Terra has forgiven them and sounds excited to see both of them again by the end of Disney Town, when Minnie is announcing the winners of the Dream Festival. Plenty of times we see Terra thinking things through and coming up with plans. He plays along with the Queen from Snow White's plan even though he has no intention of killing her, because he knows that will be more likely to succeed than a brute force effort, the exact opposite of what Aqua gets chastised for by the Fairy Godmother. He is suspicious of Hades when he runs into him, but once again plays along to see if he can learn something. You can tell this because where he puts the emphasis in the sentence, Hades, you were just playing me. Terra wrote the last half of the Keyblade Inheritance ceremony that he does with Riku on the spot. When he does the fake ceremony during a flashback with Ven, he only does the first half, and the entire second half is tailor-made for Riku's current situation. Contrary to popular belief, very few people actually trick him. Maleficent basically mind controls him, and he doesn't give her the time of day. He plays along with both the Wicked Queen and Hades for information. Everything Jumba tells him is the truth, and he makes a decision to save Stitch because he sympathizes with him. The only people who actually get one over on him are Hook, who he had no reason to disbelieve, and Xehanort, who literally tricked everybody. In general, he always gathers information before he takes action and believes in his friends even when they don't believe in him. So that was cathartic. I yep. mean, that's, yep. uh, you know, I think a large issue with BBS in general is, like, people kind of projecting themselves onto the characters and being like, well, I know Master Xehanort's a bad guy, so how could anybody fall for that? But as this person states in their take here, like, Xehanort tricked everybody. He tricked Ericus, like, to an extent he was able to evade Yen Sid, who was, like, very omniscient in some ways. So what a surprise that Xehanort manages to pull one over on Terra Aquan Ven, people who have been basically living in a bubble, raised by a fellow Keyblade Master, told that this man is their master's equal. Like, why would they distrust him? They, they don't really realize... They have no reason to Right. They don't realize that he looks like an evil man from fiction, because they're video game characters. Like, they, they don't don't exist outside of the realm of fiction. Maybe in Cage 4 they will. That's you know, remains to be seen. I do like all of the, uh, the minute details that this person threw in to uh, build up the case for Terra. Like, Terra was never going to kill Snow White. He was just playing along with the Queen in Hades for information. Um, I think that's a great pull there. Like, he's, he's not not as dense as he may appear. Um, I think the voice maybe helps people kind of associate. Like. I think so, yeah. The voice acting is a little bland and uh, seems uh, less expressive than the other two by comparison, especially. So I mean, it's uh, a yeah. race to the bottom between Terra and Aqua for expressiveness, <laughs> I would say. Yep. I think he put Jesse above the other two in terms of their performances, yeah. and especially BBS. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't know if I'm going to say, like, oh, he's... Okay, from from BBS, is he one of the smarter characters? Probably. I think I'd probably put him above Ericus, ironically enough. Probably put him above Aqua. Of the three of the Wayfinders, I probably think that he's smarter than the other two. Yeah. And the other two are faced with less on their yeah. their journey. They're not faced with the villains every time, so right. they don't have to make the hard decisions. They're always faced with the heroes who yeah. are, you know, bubbly and clearly, like, in the right most of the time. I mean, Terra's dealing with the more gray or evil characters right. who have some kind of respect in the world. There'd be no reason to, to disrespect, you know... Queens. I mean, he's dealing with yeah. royalty. So, <laughs> right, right. I mean, as far as he's concerned, these are the people that you should be trusting. But he's also not a, bo a bootlicker like Aqua right. is. Like, he doesn't yes. say, oh, my, your majesty, like, let me just, I mean, with Minnie, maybe, for a little bit, but, like, with the queen and, and, and that, like, it's, uh, he's just, he's being cautious, he's, like, like this person says, he's he's gathering information and he, and he acts later. Like, to, to say that Terra is consistently duped by all the Disney villains is, like, a total bad faith observation of the game. Yes. Like, Hook, yeah. Um, and again, like, I kind of sympathize with Captain Hook. Like, he's just trying to do his thing and Peter Pan fucking cut his hand off, you know? Yeah. Like, uh, he's not that, you know, malicious of a guy, at least when presented to Terra in Neverland and BBS. So, um, yeah, I love this. It's hard to see this uh, not progressing, but we're going to check out this Light versus Darkness take now. All right, this take about light not being equal to darkness in Kingdom Hearts comes from Joey. In the Kingdom Hearts universe, light is not equal to darkness. Light is superior. Tetsuya's use of the numbers 13 and 7 representing darkness and light go to illustrate this point. Darkness and light are said to be equal forces. That is why to form the Keyblade, equal powers of darkness, 13 pieces, and light, 7 pieces, much must clash. Ironically, the total of those numbers, 20, is nicely divisible into sets of 10. For example, could it not have been feasible to have three of the 13 pieces of darkness switch alliances to light, Shion, Saix, Terranord, Vex, and Demix, just to name a few candidates, if darkness was truly equal to light? 
If the claim that darkness and light exist in equilibrium is to be true, then the thematic usage of 13 and 7 should have poetically equalized during the events of the Keyblade Graveyard in Kingdom Hearts 3. Therefore, this inherent numerical imbalance points to the simple fact that light is greater than darkness. It's very interesting. Yep, um, totally. Like, the thing about the switching alliances with uh, Xion, Saix, Terranor, Vex Endemics, I don't know, what do, you, what do you think about this? I mean, the example that's laid out here does happen, yeah. right? Three of the pieces of darkness do switch alliances, the right. ones that they list here, Xion, Saix, and Terranor, but it doesn't happen so cleanly, like, in the moment right. to where, like, it happens before any battling happens or anything like yeah. that. It's not matching that requirement that they kind of laid out, so that's probably why that's a little bit delayed. Otherwise, it probably yeah. wouldn't have been. Uh, I think it's a, I think it's an interesting take. I probably wouldn't say that it's hotter than the Terror is right. Not Dumb one, just because you don't see this very often. Right. Like, I don't know, like and we'll probably come up with this quite a bit, but, like, I don't know how many people are, like... In the streets arguing about one. it. Yeah, yes, right, right, right. Like, nobody's really dying on this hill, though. Yeah. I tend to agree with the take, and I would say that it's hot, hence why it's in the bracket. Right. Uh, I, I just don't know if there's a lot of passion behind it. Yeah, I mean, I would. it's definitely it's an interesting observation. Um, and it, it kind of uh, makes you think about the trajectory of how the series deals with this subject, because in Cage 1, it's a very simple light versus darkness story. Light is obviously presented as being superior. Cage 2, it starts to get a little muddier, but not not quite. But then, like, once Xehanort shows up, like, as Xehanort himself, um, we start seeing, like, he he's really trying to create that balance. Um, and we're kind of trying to be... I mean, Ericus learns his lesson, like, he was blinded by the light. You know, not everybody who's associated with darkness is bad, as Riku learns. And not everybody associated with light is always right and moral, as Ericus, um you know, exemplifies. But are we shifting back to light being superior to darkness when you factor in, like, the darknesses and Union Cross and how, like, they're these primordial, like you know, super ancient uh, entities that have always existed and like how they, you know, they're not just being neutral parties, like they have malice, but they are easily defeated in the end by uh, by the player. They're tricked. It's like seven darknesses tricked by one player, if I have that correct. Yep. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely interesting to kind of track this um, and where, where we're going in the future with the series. But yeah, anyway, it's a good observation. I do have to move the, the Terra take forward, but a uh, very good effort and very uh, in interesting observation from Joey there. All yeah. right. All right, moving on. So we move on to a pair of takes that I, I don't like necessarily see too often, mm. but in the regular Pat extended universe, these, these seem to come up a lot. Okay. And they're kind of matching takes here. Uh, okay, I think I know where you're going. So let's dive in. Yeah. Number four seed is Mickey, not that bad. Right. <laughs> yeah. The, the general shitting on Michael Mouse. Yeah, and I, I have helped perpetuate this, and I am ready to kind of, uh, you know, I, I'm ready to backpedal on this a little bit. I think maybe I've gone too far. And the five seed is Anson the Wise, not that bad. Right, yes. So I, I think the Mickey hate here is definitely uh, stronger in my you know, specific neck of the woods. Anson the Wise is definitely not popular in the, uh, the greater Kingdom Hearts uh, fandom. All right, here we go with the Mickey take. This take is from Burning Mandala, who I recognize uh, from my streams. Michael Mouse did nothing wrong. People give Mickey so much shit for Aqua being in the Realm of Darkness, but if you think about it, when could Mickey have saved her? After BBS, Mickey had no idea what ended up happening to Aqua after her fight with Terranort. He even planned on giving up his Keyblade because of his guilt over failing to protect his friends and knowing nothing about their disappearances. In 0.2, Mickey could similarly not do much to save Aqua because the Demon Tide taking her away and he needed to be there to seal the keyhole or else Kingdom Hearts would have stayed open and the worlds would have been doomed. Post KH1, Mickey now knew Aqua was in the Realm of Darkness, but was similarly drifting about in there until the events of Calm happened, and he had to help Riku with his struggles with darkness. Pre KH2, Mickey was out keeping tabs on the organization and staying off the radar at the same time. I'm sure he wanted to go save Aqua, but couldn't with the looming threat of the organization. With their free reign to travel between realms, it would have been a bad idea to bring attention to Aqua as she would have been an easy target to potentially turn into a Heartless and get access to her nobody. The only reasonable time I could see people getting upset at Mickey not actively saving Aqua is post Cage 2 because they had that month period between Cage 2 and Dream Drop Distance. But to remind people, Mickey does not have the power of waking, only Sora and Riku do, so it was not a mission he could have taken on even during that time. So up until Dream Drop Distance, Mickey knew he couldn't do anything to help Aqua until Sora and Riku were given the Mark of Mastery exam and learned the power of waking. Which leads us to Cage 3, in which Mickey was finally able to tell everyone what happened to Aqua and went with Riku to save her. So to sum up, Mickey was not some villain who left Aqua in the Realm of Darkness for 10 years and doesn't deserve the hate. Okay. You see what you've done? I know what I've done, and I've helped perpetuate this. And a lot of it, to be honest, to really just kind of, uh, 
you know, talk about my own shortcomings here. I often forget that Mickey was not aware of it for 10 years. Yep. I always kind of conflate the 0.2 happenings with the secret episode of uh, BBS. Yep. Completely separate time periods. Um, so yeah, Mickey shows up in 0.2 right before Sora closes the door. That's when Mickey learns that Aqua's there. That's the, really the important key piece of information. Now, leaving a person in hell for 10 years, leaving a person in hell for one year, obviously the 10 years would be way worse. It's not true, but... One year is still pretty bad. Now, as Burning Mandala says, there are certain things keeping Mickey's attention that would prevent him from really actively, you know, sending a search party or going himself. I mean, my thing with Mickey is, like, you couldn't mention it to Yen Sid at least once. Mm -hmm. You know, Yen Sid knew about this during the the, ten, the events of 10 years ago. So it's like, surely he could have gotten something going there to get her out of there. I mean, Yen Sid is, is, a, is acquainted with Ericus, Aqua being one of Ericus's pupils. So you would think he would have made some sort of concerted effort to rescue her. Like, and I will agree, like, it's probably more important for Mickey to be kind of helping Riku along in Castle Oblivion. Like, Riku's, like, new to this whole <laughs> fighting the darkness situation. Like, Riku is definitely less experienced than Aqua. Aqua was literally named a master um, 10 years ago. So she can hold her own better than Riku probably could at that point in Chain of Memories. Um, so I get that. I, I'm, I'm kind of faltering. We're like, oh, well, Mickey had to keep Chaz in the organization. He had, couldn't stay on the radar. and didn't want to draw attention. Like, I don't know. Is the organization really keeping tabs on Mickey? Do you think Mickey is me? I think Mickey's kind of overstating his importance, being like they might be listening. Like, are they listening to you? Probably not. You know, they're more likely listening to Sora than Mickey. Right? Does Zuckerberg really want Mickey's data? I think he wants Sora's data. Yeah, probably. So I'm. That's a little weaker for me, but that and that's kind of where I mean, like, all right, really between Cage Two all the way up to the beginning of Cage Three, like there was no mention of it, and like obviously I know from the external perspective, like it just wasn't the time to do it writing wise. Like I get that. I'm not. I, I'm not feigning ignorance about that. Like, I know that's why we didn't deal with this at this point. I, I do think I've definitely overblown the Mickey hatred, and I'm willing to concede a lot of that. But I think once we get to, like, the Cage 2 Dream Drop sort of era, I'm like, what, what, what's the excuse? You know, I don't, I don't quite buy this, but I do buy a lot of what uh, Bernie Mandala proposed here, so. Yeah, this is good. Yeah. I mean, as far as the timeline stuff, yeah. uh, people kind of forget where all these events happen. Right. Between the end of Cage 1 and the beginning of Cage 3, there wasn't a lot of time to fuck around and go down to the Realm of Darkness. Sure. And, yeah. Plus, somehow he didn't have the means to do so, and he didn't really have somebody to go with. Like, it's all kind of obscure, and I'm willing to forgive some of this stuff. I actually find the Mickey stuff at the end of Cage 3 where he like doesn't include Sora mm. in like oh, the yeah. initial plan I find that way more annoying yeah than that, all this aqua shit I mean that point. yeah the aqua shit is definitely like a big part of this Mickey narrative but like the it's really not even just Mickey it's like everybody kind of like sleeping on Sora's abilities by the end of cage 3 yeah. like I know he didn't get the honorific title of master or whatever but like uh, he's still pretty good like he saved the world twice you yeah. know um, I know he like stumbled in dream drop but one out of three ain't bad you know <laughs> yes. two out of three rather it's not like these other people haven't stumbled yeah. way worse before. yeah literally everybody has stumbled I mean Riku stumbled for five games in a row until he got a shit Riku together. was possessed by the same <laughs> right. did the thing that right. they that they're, are yeah. roasting so yeah Fuck off. Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> Fuck right off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I will say, like, I guess it's hard for Mickey to get to the Realm of Darkness if the whole way that he gets there is by, like, basically hitching a ride on a planet that's ending. Like, that's yeah. how he got there in Zero Point Two is, is because that was happening during the Cage One Apocalypse. Sure. So, like, that's hard to replicate. But, like, when you got uh, Merlin and Fairy Godmother and Yen Sid, like, you know, in your Rolodex, like, how do you not mention this to somebody and, like, get someone out there? So. Right, right. These people who could just, like, go to the final world, right. you know, pull that out of their right. ass and transport <laughs> other people to yeah, other worlds. exactly. But, I mean, come on. Like, if Fairy Gma can go to the, the final world, that's way further away and way more difficult to get to yes. than, uh, should, I, should, maybe we should be hating Fairy Gma this whole time. But, probably. I mean, probably. she met Aqua, you know? Mm -hmm. Maybe Fairy, Fairy Gmon should have been kept keeping tabs on Aqua. Yeah. But, all right, that's the Mickey take. We'll move on to the uh, the Ansem the Y is not that bad take. All right, this take comes from James That's So on Twitter. I'm a filthy Ansem the Wise apologist. <laughs> Ooh, made me feel dirty. Yeah. It's not exactly a hill I'm willing to die on, but it does feel like a hill only I'm on. I obviously know how genuinely bad he is going into his plot, but for the last 17 real life years, his character motive has almost entirely revolved around making up for that. I feel like the writers kind of shot themselves in the foot when they let him sacrifice himself in Cage 2, and then just entirely undid it, but I feel like the fact that he was more than willing to die as atonement should still mean something. 
I feel like fans aren't nearly as accepting of a character growing and admitting their own mistakes as they should be for a series that's so full of flawed characters. Mm -hmm. I know the series kind of doesn't feel like that, with Sora being the poster boy and a golden child, but the cast fucks up a lot. The games not revolving around him almost entirely revolve around the concept of people making mistakes. BBS obviously has Terra and Ericus, who also gets too hard to rap, but I think there's honestly grounds to argue basically everyone in Days messes up. Riku is basically willing to sacrifice Roxas and Shion. Shion lets her insecurities get the best of her and tear a rift between herself and her friends. Axel goes on a short vacation to commit murder. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Good stuff. Some of the most powerful themes in the series are about self-improvement. It just seems wrong to sit through all of that and not be able to cut him the same slack. Ugh. You know, like, James has a point here. I mean, and I, what really hits for both of us, I think, is that, that first sentence there of that, that next paragraph. I feel like fans aren't nearly as accepting of a character growing and admitting their own mistakes as they should be for a series that's so full of flawed characters. Why are we not accepting of Ansem the Wise and his flaws? Is it because he's an old guy? probably has something to do with yeah. it i i don't really know like this is kind of another one that like i never really necessarily disagreed like i was yeah. never against ansem the wise in the way that that some people in the regular bad <laughs> yeah, yeah. eu yeah. seem to be you know I, right i don't know i mean i i really vibe with that first sentence that you just read there yeah. and the whole idea just generally of you know forgiving people yeah like okay I mean, there were way other, there were more people that did way worse shit throughout the course yeah. of the series, okay? Yeah. And Anson the Wise told them to stop what they were doing, yeah. and they continued to do it. Like, I think we're placing the blame in the wrong place here. Yeah. Now, we did sacrifice some lambs in order to get that atonement, to get that revenge yeah. there. But, like, let's not act like this is the worst thing that's ever happened, okay? <laughs> we're, we should not be making a moral equivalency between Anson the Wise and some of the other bad shit yeah. that people have done. Yeah, we have Xehanort running around, you know? Can we really uh, be dogging on Anson the Wise that hard when you have Master Xehanort, like, really throwing people to the wolves throughout the series? And I agree with uh, what James said here, that the, the writers probably took a messed up with having him sacrifice himself and then undoing it. Like, if you just have the Anthem the Wise story end with Cage 2, like, I agree, that's probably where it should have ended. I think it hits way harder. His legacy is definitely, like, that is a true atonement right there. And they just kind of, uh, they drag it out for a bit longer. Um, and then when you when you get to see all that he was up to in Days and all the behind-the-scenes stuff there, that, that kind of sours you on him. Um, so... I think, uh, I don't know, I think we're probably just biased towards being more forgiving towards uh, younger characters and specifically like playable protagonists and sure. when they make mistakes. Like when you have like an old guy that's like in his 60s and he's like, you know, he ruined the lives of many children. And I guess you have like the uh, Terranort side of things. Like did he know about what Terranort was doing with like the the children in Radiant Garden? Like, I when... really don't think so. Yeah, I mean, I don't would... think he knew the extent of these, <laughs> these yeah. war crimes <laughs> right. that were happening downstairs. Right. You would think not. Like I, I would think that uh, that that whole scene, you know, like the Melody Memory secret scene, not secret scene, but like the uh, when you're from Kyrie's perspective. Yep. Like I doubt Ansem the Wise knows that Terranor has Kyrie in the big pod thing um, in the wherever the basement of the lab. You know, um, that that scene probably takes place after the Cage Two scene where Master Ansem, regarding the like, and Ansem shuts it down. Sure. That probably happens after that when Terranor just goes fully rogue. Yep. So. Um, yeah, I, I really think it comes down to, like, just we're not as close to Ansem the Wise as a character. He's older, so, like, he probably should know better. Like, we're more forgiving of a 15-year-old making some bad decisions than, like, a 62-year-old guy. And a lot of the themes of Kingdom Hearts, especially when you look at, like, Ansem, Ericus, and Xehanort, is like, hey, the older people, the, the prior generation, really fuck things up, but, like, we're passing it on to you. So it's like we need to put the blame onto somebody because otherwise there's, like, everybody is to blame, basically, because everybody, as they say, fucks up a lot. Yep. So... I don't know. Which one do I want to advance here? Which is more compelling to you? I think I'm more compelled by the ends of the wise stuff. Because isn't the Mickey stuff kind of just a meme at this point? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the Mickey stuff is a meme for me. Like, he's not nearly as bad as I, as I joke about him being on stream and stuff. Right. Um, you know, I think a lot of it boils down to, like, you know, the corporate mascot getting in the way of important stuff. And, right. you know, dogging on Sora for not being good at what he does. Um, which, again, as we mentioned, more to do with uh, my personal Mickey distaste than the Aqua <laughs> stuff at, at times. So um, I think I'm going to advance the Ants and the Wise take, but they were both well done. Um, was that uh, not an upset, but was that five beating four there or what? That was five beating four. Okay, pretty cool. Not a huge upset, yeah. but a little, a little shake yeah. up, though, in the bracket. A little shake up. All right. What is our next round here? All right. The three seed Saix is the main antagonist of Cage 2. Mm versus the six seed Larxene is the best lady character. Mm. We got some organization synergy here. 
pretty interesting. Oh, let me pull up that Psyx one. This one was not signed, but I do know this one is by one of my patrons and Twitch mods, Gotvaka. Saix is the main antagonist in Cage 2, and here's why. Xemnas barely interacts with Sora directly. His beef seems to be with Ansem the Wise, and only by extension it's Sora because Sora is a good guy. In contrast, Saix antagonizes Sora in Twilight Town and Hollow Bastion before the world it never was. Saix is the one who really explains why they need Heartless. Saix is the one to hold Kairi hostage once Axel handed her over to the organization. Saix is the one who gets attacked by Riku briefly, basically has beef with everyone including Pete and Maleficent. Sora also submits to Saix to try to prove how important Kairi is, something he never does to any other villain. Also, Saix has a way more compelling reason to want Kingdom Hearts to be completed, again not taking into consideration his motivations in Days or 3. What even is Xemnas' reason in 2? To have a heart? Well, we know that's a lie. Saix is as clear, he wants a heart. Even his death is more tragic and meaningful than Xemnas' in 2. Here's a comparison. Xemnas might be the Fire Lord Ozai, but Saix is the Azula, and we all know who is the more compelling, interesting, and antagonizing villain. I mean, this is something that I've actually always, not always agreed with, but like, I, I totally see the case. Like, I've come around on this before seeing this take. For me, like, I want the villain to kind of have a personal sort of relationship with the protagonist, you know? Like, and that's something that is kind of lacked in KH1. Like, there's really, with Sora and Ansem, like, there's really no conversation between the two besides the secret place, right? Yep. And by the time he shows up in the flesh, Sora is a heartless, so they're not getting to talk there, and then they don't, they don't speak again until... Um, Destiny Islands, Homecoming, and End of the World, right? So, like, there's really no personal relationship there, and likewise with Sora and Xemnas, and, you know, as Gavaka says here, like, Xemnas is really more so a foil to, like, the institution of light, basically. Like, Yen Sid, Ansem the Wise, Mickey, like, that's really, like, it's like Xemnas and the organization versus that whole kind of sect of people. But, like, as a personal um, relationship between protagonist and antagonist. I think what Gavaka says here is totally true. Saix is there in the weeds, you know, really uh, picking on Sora and really uh, getting his goat there and explains the entire plot. Um, so if we're talking like, man, like, obviously the game doesn't want you to think that. Like, I think the game thinks that Xemnas is the main antagonist, but for me, when it comes to what I value in a protagonist antagonist relationship, I think Sora and Saix is uh, leagues ahead of Sora and Xemnas. So I think that's uh, pretty compelling there. Yeah, Xemnas is kind of the guy who's going to be in the the opening cutscenes and everything, and the you know what I mean, the mm -hmm. the opening to the games. Mm -hmm. it, you know, he's kind of the figurehead for the KH two conflict. Yeah. But yeah, Saix is really the one on the ground doing the the dirty work and being an asshole the entire way there. Yeah. I mean, he definitely makes Sora rage a lot more than Xemnas does. Yeah. I mean, they hardly even talk, as you mentioned. There's there's nothing really going on there. Yeah. Yes, Xemnas is more of a foil to the to the overall series, but when it comes down to like a one on one conflict, like who's really pushing the protagonist forward, it's always Saix. He's always there kind of on the elbows of the story yeah. and kind of pushing everything ahead for Sora at least. Uh, yeah, so it's an interesting argument. I that. always felt more satisfied when you dealt with Saix in The World Never Was as opposed to Xemnas. Because I was like, you motherfucker, like you made Sora get on his knees and he told him no. Like that's just brutal, you know? And Xemnas really never got that antagonistic or personal with Sora, so um I totally see that. The only thing with the take here is like I don't think this makes anybody upset when Gavaka says this. You know right. what I mean? Like I think ideally a take might anger people a little bit or might make them question it. Like this is more so like a new reading of a situation that right. people may not consider, kind of like the light versus darkness thing. Like, people aren't getting in the weeds and going out in the streets with their signs about this take, like some of the other ones that we'll see later, like the terror is not dumb thing. That's yep. something that people really clash over. So I do really like the argument here. Um, I'm interested to see if the um, the other take, the, the Lark scene take, is maybe more uh, contentious, and we'll see what that one looks like. All right, this is an anonymous take, and I can see that there's swear words in it, so it's perfect. <laughs> All right, let's have a go. Arxene is the most well-written lady in the series. Love her or hate her, but she is the only one to have more than three personality traits. Seriously, name me three things about Naminé that isn't nice and likes art. <laughs> I just realized this is also Gavaka's take, did you know that? Jesus Christ. Gavaka is submitted too, and this is also hers. So, go. I'm sorry, go on. Seriously, name me three things about Naminé that isn't nice and likes art. <laughs> also, Larxene's convictions are more compelling. All the other lady characters' personalities are based on the men in their life. That's sexist as fuck. <laughs> Larxene, though, she'll betray anyone just for fun. The only character who is close is Aqua. However, up to this point, Aqua's, bless her soul, entire motivation is contingent on the boys in her life. She's a Keyblade Master, and legit she has to babysit Terra and Ventus. Why doesn't she get to do anything cool? Larxene, though, she does things because she's just an evil bitch and because she feels like it. 
Also, she's the only one to insult Xemnas directly in 3, and that's just cool. This isn't shade to any of the other ladies, just the writers. Right, yeah, good good caveat there at the end, good uh, good distinction. I <laughs> So I, re I really like how uh, this was approached. Um, I don't really... <sighs> I think it's probably a hot take, only because Larxene, relative to... You know, Kyrie, Naminé, Aqua, Shion is a more minor character, at least up to this point in the saga. We might see more with her, you know, coming back with the Elrena of it all. But, um, I just don't know if I fully buy it. Like, when we say that, uh, name three things about Naminé that isn't nice and likes art, like, sure, maybe true. Well, I, I mean, I think that's kind of downplaying Naminé a little bit. Like, Naminé kind of has, like, the tortured soul sort of archetype where, like, she's, you know, being forced to do this thing against her will. Um, it's definitely like a moral conflict in her head. Like, she's definitely not uh, a perfect person in Kong, even though she's being forced to do it. Like, you know when uh, Sora chooses to get his memories back? Like, she's clearly, like, kind of offended by that at the end. And it's like, well, Nominate, like, you fucked around with his head for, like, the last 13 floors. So <laughs> I don't know why you're... Like, there's something there to Nominate. And, like, granted, she drops off after Kong. Like, they're not doing a ton with her after that. But, like, I don't know... Can you name three Larkseen personality traits outside of she's kind of... Sadistic. sadistic and manipulative right? right like i think that's kind of her whole thing but in fairness i think you know most characters in the series have one or two personality traits that you kind of just uh harp on over and over it's true um so <laughs> yeah play the clip i mean which is interesting i think this take is probably um more contentious but i don't know if i buy it as much as the the previous take um which was about i've already forgotten what was the one we just said <laughs> Yeah, the one about Saix <laughs> right, being yeah. the main antagonist of Cage 2. Yeah, I think that one's probably more well-argued, and although not as contentious, I think it uh, just makes better points. I do like that Larxene, um, you know, says uh, Xemnas in 3 and calls Demix a cereal bowl or whatever. Uh, it's, it's, she's very fun. Like, I think she's a fun character. Um, I don't know who I would say is the most well-written lady in the series. Do you have a personal stake in that? Like, I, I've not really thought about it, to be honest. I think, uh, think Namara could do better on all of them, so... I would kind of thing Shion right off the top of yeah. my head I haven't given it a ton of thought but isn't a lot of Larkseen's character personality her motivations based on a man in her life though isn't she kind of pulled ahead by Marluxia, Marluxia a little a bit. lot of what she's doing yeah. I mean even in three like she kind of goes to him for approval it's like you up for another coup yeah like yeah. she's not just taking that no she doesn't being, she like, never takes the reins my own thing. I mean she's very much always a sidekick to Marluxia right both in three and calm even in what we see in Union Cross like Lorium's the guy that's involved El is barely even featured in that game yep so um you know really a lot of uh, I don't know how often Kingdom Hearts passes the Bechtel test um, hopefully it's something they get better at moving forward, but uh, I think I'm probably more convinced by the Saix take. I think that's uh, probably more well-argued, so I'm going to move that one along there. All right, sounds good. Good job, Gavaka. So that moves us on to the two-seed. Sora does not deserve to be a master Ooh. versus the seven seed. Naminé is manipulative. Okay, I've got some more Naminé takes to talk about. That's interesting. <laughs> um, all right, Sora does not deserve to be a master. Yeah, that's definitely hot, right? I feel like a lot of people are like... What the fuck? Why isn't he a master? I feel like most people disagree with the route that the games took. Yep, this one definitely passes the, the scorching test for sure. All right, this take is from Syllablossom Gaia, um, another one of my patrons. I swear I didn't uh, <laughs> I didn't just pick people to, to pay me. Uh, you know, I think if you're smart enough to pay me on a regular basis, you probably are smart enough to write a good take. I think that's kind of. I kinda... don't know if that's the crossover <laughs> I would have gone no? with there. I mean, listen, I just don't want people to think I'm playing favorites. <laughs> but uh, you know, I I think there might be a bit of a correlation. But still, Blossom Guy says, I hope this take is hot enough. Sora does not deserve to be a Keyblade Master. He didn't deserve it when Yen said originally gave him the test, and he doesn't even deserve it now. I love Sora, of course I do, but I believe he has consistently refused to actually grow beyond my friends are my power, I'm nothing without them. I think Yen said noticed this during the test and would not have passed Sora even if he had not fallen to darkness at the end. That's very spicy. Uh, I've heard a lot of people say the test was not fair and that Yen Sid deceived them. I would argue that he had to deceive them and he had alerted them to the true purpose of the test. Both Sora and Riku would have gone to absurd lengths to give themselves the power of waking, which, although not super clearly defined, has to come from a connection you make with your whole heart. This isn't something that can be forced. Riku was able to do it easily because of his bond with Sora. Sora later does this to wake Ven, but this was after the test. Sora refuses to grow as a character or as a Keyblade wielder. Sure, he learns new tricks, but Riku is the only one to show enough introspection to confront his inner struggles and emerge victorious. Dream Drop was his finest hour for this reason. Sora having the Keyblade is something of a fluke to begin with, and I find that after 2, he acts particularly entitled to it. In Dream Drop, he essentially dicks around with Disney characters and doesn't take the test seriously. <laughs> 
I guess I never considered that. Either. <laughs> um, he does this to a lesser extent in 3. I do not believe that Sora as we know him, despite everything he's capable of, actually deserves to be a Keyblade Master. I think if the series wants to go that route in the future, it would behoove them to seriously have Sora reflect on himself and develop beyond simply being a friend to all living things. As it stands, he's in danger of becoming a flat character, and I think if any master, Michael, Riku, Aqua, or Yen said again, tests him and passes him without him going through this arc, it would be a disservice to the intended purpose of the test. Thank you for your time, hope it was spicy enough to make the cut. Well, thank you for thanking me for my time, Silla Blossom, I appreciate that. And it was spicy enough It was enough spicy enough, cut. it's certainly spicy. God, I feel like I need like a week to think about that one. Mm, yeah, <laughs> you know? there's, a lot to, uh, there's a lot to uncover there. Yeah, um... I listen. I think I'm definitely less of a Sora fan than most. Um, if you look at your your typical, your average bear, uh, Kingdom Hearts fan, like I think I'm probably not as like big on Sora as most people because I do find him to be kind of flat. Um, I mean, Silver Blossom saying he's in danger of becoming flat. I've kind of always found him a little flat, but I'm never really the biggest fan of like the main character in almost anything. Um, it's usually the side or the supporting or the antagonist that I'm more of a fan of and more interested in. Um, but I agree, like. I don't know where you go with Sora beyond, like, my friends are my power, I'm nothing without them. I mean, he really crumbles based on that whole mantra in KH3 during the uh, the Demon Tide of it all, when Riku has to kind of uh, step up there. Um, you know, I've always long been a fan of that scene, and, uh, you know, yeah, although Riku did not have much to do in 3, like, he really uh, stepped up in that moment. This goes back to the character bracket again, <laughs> actually. So, yeah, like, does not deserve it. It's tough, because, like, really, he is the guy, and we just talked about this with the Michael take, like, he's the guy who gets shit done in cage one and two like you look at the track record you look at his his accolades like he saved the world not single-handedly but like he was the driving force for both one and two you know and then in the end with three like he's he's definitely playing his part i feel like maybe he takes the biggest back seat in three would you say Sora? yeah in terms of like defeating the final antagonist mm. i mean he he does have like the it's him and sd or him and donald and goofy at the end but like I don't know, like, I feel like with the whole 13 and 7 thing, like, it really feels like more of a team effort. Oh, yeah. So right. maybe you consider, like, his his accomplishments in 3 to be lesser, even though Xehanort, I think, as even in his old man form, was probably more of a threat than Ansem and, and Xemnas. Um, I don't know. I, I just think deserves. That's a tricky word, right? That like, is the key here. Because, yeah. Because, I mean, if he doesn't, then, I mean, who on the list does? I mean, Michael and Aqua, well, still they awesome certainly guy. do not. That's the thing, yeah, like... I know that the, the mark of mastery tests are probably relative to each character. Like, you might consider Aqua's mark of mastery to be, like, you know, five-year process that just happened to cap off with a light ball battle and a Terra duel. Like, right. just that being the test seems a little, um, you know, lopsided when compared to Sora and Riku's test. Sure. Um, Aqua stayed in one room for her whole test, whereas Sora and Riku went to several sleeping worlds and faced real danger. Yes. Um, so, you know, the, the tests have never been equal. Um, I don't even know how Michael got his license. Yeah, I mean, he failed and got the license. We never really... Sora failed and didn't get the license. <laughs> right. I don't know how this computes. It was the same guy giving out the license, yeah. too. Yeah. So what the fuck? Yeah. I don't know. This this is hot, but it's really on. it's really <laughs> It's really hot, but yeah, I just like... If Sora doesn't deserve it, and we're saying that Riku, Aqua... Like, I know we're, I guess we're kind of talking about, like, character strength here, but not so much, like, feats or accomplishments. Um, and I think it has to be a balance of those two things. Like... Yes. Sora could be a flawed character, you know, till the cows come home, but, like, if he's fucking putting in the work and saving the world, it's hard to deny that any of that. overrides everything yeah. else. It's Nobody's like, around to be there to become a master right. if Sora doesn't save the world multiple times Like, over. clearly, Ericus and Xehanort and, you know, Michael, Riku, Aqua, Yen Sid, I mean, maybe less Yen Sid, Yen Sid's never been a flawed character, I, I would say. But, like, Xehanort and Ericus have the master title. They're clearly not perfect individuals. They clearly have character flaws. You would argue that maybe they're both also kind of one note and flat. I would say more so Ericus than Xehanort, but it's, it's kind of close. Yeah. Um, so... You know, I, I want to hear the next take, and then we'll see what's gonna what's gonna pass on here. I, I have pros and cons to this one. I think it's it's definitely very well written, um, but I'm not sure if I fully buy the premise. But it's definitely scorching hot. All right, this is a anonymous take, an anonymous take, I should say. Naminé in the opening of Cage 2 is actually purposely being highly manipulative, manipulating Roxas at every turn to give up his existence in order to fulfill her promise to Sora. She isn't reaching out to him because she cares about him, but because he's the only thing that stands in the way of Sora being able to wake up. She positions herself as someone he can trust in contrast to Axel, Diz, and Riku, all in order to push him to give up his existence, including telling him he won't disappear if he does, even though she admits in 
the cage to ending, she thought nobodies would just fade into the darkness. There's tons of evidence of this in the framing of scenes. People think they have romantic vibes, but it ain't true, sis. <laughs> I like that I'm getting the really yeah. sassy. <laughs> yeah, no, it's funny. We, we did not plan who would read what. It's just, uh, you know, we're, we're trading off. I don't know about this one. Uh, it just seems like a stretch to me. Like, I... I never even once considered this, and maybe that's why I'm having trouble kind of unpacking it right here. But like, this kind of seems like an like an alternative character reading to me. I guess it's hot, but only by virtue of I've never heard anyone argue this uh, or the contrary. Like, I, I mean, I, I never hear Nominee's intentions in Cage Two really being discussed that much. I guess, which is why maybe I'm having trouble kind of uh, discerning my feelings on this. Purposely being manipulative? Like, I don't think so. Maybe inadvertently. Maybe. I mean, again, just like in Calm, like her hand's kind of being forced, like she's kind of stuck playing, a, you know, either being a pawn of Diz or like trying to run away from him towards the end of that whole Twilight Town arc there. I, I just don't know if I buy that, to be honest. Like, I don't I don't think Naminé has ever been willfully manipulative or, or malicious. Yeah, I, mean, I would tend to agree with that. I, I feel like, uh, I don't know, I, I think other than seeing the the larger larger picture you would never be able to come up with this like just if you played cage two right you know with just that it doesn't seem to make me think that because i mean isn't the plan for her to die at the end of the prologue like that scene that got added into final mix mm -hmm. there like axel was supposed to kill riku and not or riku was supposed to kill nomine and axel at the end. Oh, right. There's a scene added in there. Yeah, because... So you know that she's under some duress there. Yeah, Like, yeah, this yeah. is not being nice throughout this whole right, process. Right, right. So, I mean, she has to get something done, yeah. or else he'll just eliminate her before that scene yeah. even happens. I'm willing to forgive Naminé for maybe accidentally being a bit manipulative if her life is at risk, you yes, know? Yes, right. Like, I just I just think this is not entirely a good faith argument. Well, not, not, not that it's not good faith, I just... I think it's a bit of a stretch to be like, yeah, she means to be like this way. Like, I, I don't think, uh, I don't think she's like, you know, toying with Roxas just because she's trying to get her own selfish ends met. Right. Um, and even if she was like, I think it's an excusable situation. Plus, there's not really much on the other side for her. I mean, she probably wants to see Sora again, but I mean, is it really worth putting it all? Like, I don't know. The the end goal doesn't like wouldn't justify yeah. all of that purposely being manipulative yeah me. i agree i don't know yeah so i mean uh it's interesting for sure i think it's a, it's a fun reading but uh, i'm gonna move the Scylla blossom uh sword doesn't deserve to be a master take to the next round cool all right the one seed in this part of the bracket is kingdom hearts 2 final mix critical is not the interesting or meaningful challenge everyone says it is oh my god it's so cutting. I love the way that that's worded. Yeah, it's like taking words right out of. This the is the first one. Some. Yeah, is the first one that's gonna make people upset. I think. Yeah. Okay. And the eight seed is much more harmless. That <laughs> Kingdom Hearts One's magic is better than Cage Two's magic system. Okay. Interesting. So we have uh, Cage Two hatred hours, which you know, I think people are really like, especially if you're on Twitter, like you think I genuinely hate Cage Two. Um, I just think it's maybe a little overrated, that's all. It's still in my top 10 games of all time. It's my third favorite game in the series. Just to always reiterate that, because I constantly need to. Okay, this one is from Rickaby on Twitter. Critical mode, particularly in 2FM, where checkpoints are needlessly and inexplicably sparse, is not the interesting or meaningful challenge that everyone thinks it is. It's cool in theory that you get a few tools to help mitigate the additional challenge, but in practice that additional challenge pretty much exclusively comes from having no HP and MP, which your additional tools don't meaningfully address. You pretty much just aren't allowed to get hit, which forces you to play the game in a methodical, overly cautious way that I just don't find fun in the slightest. I think it's unreasonable to demand absolutely perfect play with zero mistakes, even from a player who willingly selected the highest difficulty level. Even famously hard games like Dark Souls or Ninja Gaiden don't punish every small mistake with instant death. I like a good challenge as much as the next guy, but I think it's really sloppily implemented in 2FM, and it makes for a super weird difficulty curve where the hardest parts of the game are throwaway minigame segments like the Hades Chase and Hyena Defense. I think the game is just more fun on Proud. Yeah, you don't hear that a lot. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm inclined to agree that Kingdom Hearts 2 Final Mix Plus is not like God's gift to gaming. I think Cage 2 as a whole package is overrated, but I think especially like, yo, 2FM Plus Crit Level 1, like, is not like 
the flawless experience that everyone says it is. The peak of all interactive material yeah. that's ever been created. <laughs> right, right. I think people are super hy hyperbolic about it. I get being a fan of it. I get enjoying it. I'm not going to knock anybody for enjoying, um, you know, the games that they like. Um, I just think like, and you know, I think there's a history of toxicity with specifically this game and the more nitty gritty sort of gameplay side of things, right. which I've never been a fan of. Um, so again, I'm not saying, oh, you shouldn't enjoy this, and I'm, I don't think Rick could be is either. I just think it's kind of lowered over everybody else as like, this is what we should be aspiring for. Like, this is really the peak of the series in a gameplay sense. It's fine if you agree that, but I don't think we should be like pressuring Square Enix interns to be like, yo, make sure you tell Nomura, we got to get this shit to be back to 2FM quality. Like, I don't, I played it on stream recently. They're just like these shitty, like this, like Rick be says, sloppily implemented moments where like you're in a reaction command during a Zigbar fight and you're, you're in the air and the, the reaction command ends and you're just wide open and there's nothing, unless you have full MP and you're ready to cast reflect as soon as you're out of that, that scripted animation, you're just going to get hit by a bullet and die. Like there's just moments like that, like Rick be says with the hate escape and the hyena defense like there's these like gimmicky minigame-esque moments that kind of sour the experience and like i think kind of drag down the uh the sanctity of 2fm <laughs> so uh i'm pretty invested in this take so far um so we'll see what this uh, magic one is all about here all right we've got an anonymous take here magic in cage one is infinitely better than cage two Cage 1 has a wide range of spells that I actually find useful, arrow and stop for example, and even the offensive spells actually have a purpose due to the slower pace of the physical combat. Meanwhile, Cage 2 has reflect and the such, but the offensive spells do not speak to me at all, because I can deal exponentially more damage physically than even using shortcuts to fight with spells. Not to mention the bar. I hate that thing with every fiber of my being. <laughs> Healing myself should not take up all my MP, especially seeing as though some of the bosses will just deplete my health in 3 seconds again. I wish that healing would only take up half the bar so I could have a spare heal if I would need it directly after the first. I just wish it would use KH1's magic system for future games. You know, I think this is something I've always subtly felt, like I feel like I would tend to use KH1 magic more often. I think once you get to like that 2FM degree of play, you're probably, you know, mash it on reflect a bit more frequently than you, you might in a casual playthrough. But I don't really look at the game's quality from like uh, a super self-imposed challenge sort of lens. Mm -hmm. So like I typically judge these games by like how they feel to play on a casual playthrough or a casual replay through. And I mean, I agree with this. I don't know how hot it is. Like I feel like... Um, I mean, are people really, like, getting in the weeds about this one? I don't know. I feel like yes, because yeah. it's a Cage 1 versus Cage 2 thing. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's timeless. Cage 2 improved on everything that Cage 1 did, right? right? Yeah, everyone says it's a perfect sequel, yeah. Yes. I, I mean, I do, I think there is more utility to the Cage 1 spells. Like, maybe, maybe you don't need either game's magic that much to reliably get through them. Like, I think as a kid, I probably didn't really delve that deep into either the offensive or defensive magic in either game. Like, uh, this person says here, like... I mean, the KH1 spells just feel more unique and, like, they have a different, uh... Beyond combat, too. Yeah, they, environmental stuff. The magic stuff. system is better because there is the environmental stuff, you know, with Thunder yeah. and Traverse Town, 3rd yeah. District, and to open up the, the Blizzard, gates uh, in Merlin's. Yeah, the, yep, the gates in Merlin. Progression. And the gravity lift stop. Mm chest and things like Maleficent's, that. I mean, uh, Maleficent's platform in, uh, in her boss battle. The way that it's integrated is much better. Whether the system actually functions better, I'm not sure, but the way that it's implemented into the game that it's in, yeah. that is better in Cage 1, I think. Yeah. And I've felt this way for some time. Yeah. I think the uh, cure thing, I'm kind of half and half on, like, I, it is definitely annoying at times, and I can see why people think that KH1 can kind of just let you heal through a bunch of attacks over and over because your MP bar can get, you know, exponentially bigger as, as you progress. My issue is less with Kier taking up all of the health. Like, if, if Kier takes up the whole MP bar, that's fine, whatever. But I would prefer that I could hasten my MP being replenished by, like, doing physical hits like you do in KH1. Um, the fact that if you use a Kier you're locking yourself not only out of other cures, which I, I get that as like a punishment, but like out of other magic, it just seems annoying to me, to be honest. So yeah. if I'm going to lose all my MP, I want to at least have that risk versus reward of going in and hitting stuff right. and then being able to gain it back and, you know, cure or use other magic, which I think that's a fun system in KH1. It's like you can deplete all of your MP by healing and you need to heal again and you just kind of got to go in and get some hits in to build that back up. Sure. So I, I definitely prefer that. But I think the uh, this was a one versus eight, so I, I'm probably going to go with the one seed there just kind of overall talking about the uh, the 2FM experience. Sure. 
Yeah. It's, it's it's spicy for sure. It's tough to match up with. Cage yeah. to FM plus is uh, <laughs> is always going to be spicy. It's There's a no way to criticize that without it being a hot take. Yeah, so. for sure. Yeah, but this is good though. This yeah. is good. So the four seed in this part of the bracket is Arendelle is a well-designed world. Mm. And the five seed is Cage One Disney World Design Peaks with Wonderland. Interesting. So we got some world design takes here. So this is from the Cartoon Buffoon, another uh, Twitch regular, and I actually did read this one on stream, and I had a feeling when I read it that it would uh, make it all the way into the top 32. So this will be my second read through of this one. And I gotta say, it's, uh, it's a pretty good argument coming up, and I'm uh, historically not a big Arendell fan. But, Arendelle is a well-designed world, one of the best in KH3. No other world in the game consistently demands that you engage with its layout in an interesting way. While every room may be aesthetically similar and you may not know them by name, the gameplay moments each one creates are incredibly distinct. Air-stepping and running up different levels of the mountain to quickly ascend, running across a large wall to try and avoid grounded enemies, launching up wind paths to progress further, pushing against a storm to reach the kingdom, not to mention adapting certain iconic parts of the mountain like the frozen lake with the trees that look like teardrops and the frozen over stabby icicles. And none of this has even started to cover the ice labyrinth, which is effectively a more creative and engaging version of Elsa's palace with its own slew of standout rooms. And let's be real, the ice palace in the movie is really just two big empty rooms. It wouldn't have been that cool to explore. Most other worlds in the game will only ask you to creatively traverse the world all of one or two times, but Arendelle is always throwing something new and interesting at you. I will even justify a frozen slider and finding Olaf. That first escape from the Frost Serpents is very cool and intense, and while his voice may be grating, the Olaf scavenger hunt is a fun bit of forced exploration, which I feel only adds to the overall world experience. Finally, my favorite little idea in the whole world, taking a boss you just fought within the world and making that boss a party member that totally wrecks shop. Such a cool victory for the player as this boss uses moves they just used to murder your ass to murder your enemies. I feel like I'm gonna get off topic if I keep going, so I'll just end by saying Let It Go is still a banger. And that's true. Listen, I think Let It Go kind of gets uh, unfairly shit on. Let It Go's great. It suffered from overplay. You know, it made it onto contemporary radio somehow. I didn't need it there, but it's a good song. Yep. So yeah, once I do get to that inevitable KH3 world ranking video, Arendelle was always going to be low, but Buffoon makes a lot of points that appeal to my sensibilities when it comes to judging a world uh, strictly on a design level. And I, you know, notice that Buffoon does not really tackle it from a story or gameplay or like story and gameplay integration level, um, because as we've mentioned, as you and I both agree, like Arendelle suffers from doing the movie plot itis very badly. Yeah. And Sora, Donald, and Goofy are, it would be almost generous to consider them bystanders to this world. Yep. Um, they're really just so pushed to the side. But as a world, in terms of playing through it, and, and Buffoon concedes a lot of points here that the rooms are aesthetically similar, and as a whole, I have trouble remembering like what connects to what because of that, that kind of similarity. Everything's just kind of white, snowy mountainsides. Um, but the rooms themselves, the areas themselves, the set pieces are very fun to traverse through. Um, it is unique in that I don't, I'm not going to say it's the best design in the world in KH3. I disagree with that first point here, but I do think it is kind of unfairly shit on, at least by me. Um, maybe I had, <laughs> maybe I had not considered some of these, um, finer details here. I agree with the finding Olaf thing. Like, obviously it suffers from, you know, find the ingredients sort of, uh, voice line stuff. But, um, you know, I always like exploration games, um, and in, in these Kingdom Hearts games specifically, so I, uh, I think it's a, it's a good point there. Like, it really is kind of forcing you to look around and you know, take your, your surroundings into account. And you could be wrong. If Finding Olaf yeah. happened in Cage one you'd yeah. think it's, like, the greatest fucking thing of all time, okay? <laughs> You're right! You're totally right. And yes. it, yeah, <laughs> Especially the fact that you can get it wrong and you get, like, a little alternate scene. Like, that's very charming. Yep. Um, that's, that's some Cage 3 charm right there. Yeah, I mean, and I agree with the Ice Palace, like, the Labyrinth, again, while the rooms are all kind of muddied up in my head as, like, I don't know what connects to what, and it all kind of looks the same, there are just, like, parts of it that are, like, really fun and cool to traverse through. And I think I've just been sleeping on it in terms of its its pure level design. I think I, I don't think I, it moves up substantially in my KH3 world rankings, but I do think that uh, I've maybe let the story side of things and the overall general aesthetic kind of get in the way of the smaller details, so... I think Buffoon did a great job at uh, moving the needle for me here. Totally. I've always enjoyed the aesthetic. I've liked Arendelle more than the average person probably for a while, so yeah. uh, I have little to add other than praising the defense of finding Olaf there. Yeah, good stuff. All right, this next take comes from Territrius. In terms of Disney world designs, Kingdom Hearts peaked early in Wonderland. 
Few levels and games across many different generations and franchises have given me the sense of rewarding exploration the way Wonderland did in KH1. It's seriously hard to find every secret without a guide, but the game doesn't force you to. You can finish the world with very little exploration, but for those wanting to explore, it has something awesome in every nook, cranny, clock, painting, faucet, or flower pot. Short and sweet. Yeah, Good very short and here. sweet. It's nice to have a little bit of a breather sometimes. <laughs> so thank you, Territrius. I did give people a 500 word limit on these, and that was way too generous of me. I should, <laughs> I should, they should have been like, you 50 know. 50 characters. Yeah, 50 characters, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I don't know if I, I mean, people are always so hard on the KH1 world design in general that it's hard to even find anybody who's calling it good in Which the way that I do. incredible. Yeah. Because it actually is the best world design in the I, series. I but... think it does, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I think some people are like, well, it's confusing and it takes me a little longer to get through. That doesn't mean it's bad, though. Yeah. <laughs> like, I guess if, it, if it's confusing every single world, it could be bad. But, like, don't tell me that, like, that Agrabah is really that confusing or Halloween Town or, or Neverland even, like... And I prefer the honest challenge over one hallway. Yeah, exactly. You know? I'd rather stumble around in the dark a bit than just to be, you know, given... I mean, how dare Halloween Town and Cage 2 give you a map in Dr. Fink's lab? How and then dare How you? fucking dare that game give you a map for two hallways? Yep. It's it's one hallway spread across two holidays. Yep. That's what it is. Um, so, we're getting off on the tangent here, but... <laughs> The, uh, the peak of Disney World design being Wonderland. Um, yeah, if we're just limiting it to Disney, then I probably agree. Although I really... I mean, Halloween Town... Halloween Town is kind of like a straight shot in KH1. Not a straight shot, but like you're you're going so far, then you backtrack to the lab, then you go a little bit further, then you go back to the lab again. It goes a little bit more vertical, but yeah. I know what you mean, though. Yeah. I mean, Wonderland is, is the peak of creativity, for sure. I would um, say so, yeah. I'd agree. And I, I don't disagree with any of this, but again, I don't know how many people are like arguing about Wonderland. I feel like, uh, and maybe that's just because the conversation has moved to newer games when we're talking about like Twitter discourse or whatever. Sure. Like I think Arendell being a good world is definitely gonna be spicier than Wonderland being the peak of KH1. Like it's a little too specific. And yeah. while I do agree with it, and I think there's this is all very true, I'm probably gonna move forward with the uh, Arendell take there. All right, sounds good. The three seed here is Monstro is the best Disney World in the series. Okay. And the sixth seed is Cage 3's combat has more depth than Cage 2's. Oh Another one of those. <laughs> you know, we're really asking for it now. <laughs> um, all Somebody's right. gonna lay out a knuckle sandwich here. Yeah, no, I, I think I, a, lot, a lot of knuckle sandwiches, like a whole buffet table of knuckle sandwiches coming my way. <laughs> Uh, Alright, this is another take that I read on stream. This is from uh, What's Up Carl, another one of my patrons. So let's get into this one here. Okay, my spiciest take about Cage is that Monstro is the best Disney world in the entire series. First off, I love the world design. I know all the naysayers will say that it is very samey with all the different chambers, but I feel like utilization of the layers in each room helps each one feel distinct. Also, what other world uses a Heartless to help determine where you need to go? Uh, none that I can think of, and that's so sick. And this refers to the Green Requiems uh, being above the chambers that lead to progress up to the Parasite Cage 1 fight. If you talk to Geppetto, I'll tell you about it. Did you know? It's in one of my Cage 1 uh, fact videos. Yeah. It's pretty good stuff. You can check it out. Um, besides the chambers, I feel like the mouth, stomach, and throat are all designed very well. Those rooms are very interesting and have a lot of great detail when it comes to how they're designed. They walk the line of being realistic, but also fun and playful. As for the story, it's very charming with the introduction of the world where Donald and Goofy are getting items thrown at them, the joke about it being heavy showers, come on, that's so good. I also think having characters from Jiminy's world appear here provides a new perspective on Jiminy as a character. I think we can all agree, Jiminy sucks, but also <laughs> knowing more about your journal keeper gives him more dimension, and I appreciate that in the way of character development for both Pinocchio, Jiminy, and the party. Now for the juicy stuff, you fight alongside Riku. When in the series are you fighting alongside someone who you're beefing with? I guess just Marshmallow later on, but then yep. even then that's he's like... That's way more impactful than this, so <laughs> yeah, we're gonna have true. to count this out. <laughs> that's true. Having him in the first Parasite Cage boss battle has so many implications. Even though Riku and Sora have very different reasons for fighting the Parasite Cage, Riku wants Pinocchio's heart for Kairi and Sora wants to save Pinocchio from Riku, they still have the same goal in mind of getting him out of there. This is such a parallel to the overall arc of the story, where Riku and Sora both have the same goal but are choosing very different routes to getting there, dark versus light. I don't often see other Disney worlds have this much of a connection to the overall story of Kingdom Hearts. I don't necessarily think Monstro accomplishes every aspect perfectly, but all of the points mentioned work together to make it the best Disney World in the series, in my opinion. So, listen, I've always been kind of a Monstro guy. I think the last time I wasn't a Monstro guy is when I first played through it as a, you know, a six-year-old and got confused by the chambers. But once you fucking grow up and you learn how to get through it, don't you get over that? Yeah. Like, I swear to God, there were like 32-year-olds out there who were like, oh, I, I got lost in Monstro for a couple of minutes when I was eight and now I, like, I cry in the shower every night. Like, get the <laughs> fuck over it, you know? It's not that confusing. Like, God forbid it doesn't just lay it out there for you. It's just so clunky. 
Oh, oh no! Oh no! It didn't. Oh, I didn't get to go oh. exactly where I wanted to go immediately. Oh no! I was dumb once, oh. and now I still kind of <laughs> am. Look at my tears in the shower. Oh. oh. No. Anyway. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, if you look at my KH1 world ranking, I'm definitely a big proponent of Monstro in the story sense. Um, I think it is close to being uh, undefeated. Like, you, the Space Paranoid's integration with the, like, the overall KH2 story is very good. Um, and Neverland also gives Monstro a run for its money. And I do tend to have Neverland higher just because of like the tension that's building before the Hollow Bastion sort of penultimate um, finale situation. But, uh, you know, you can't really, like, say, like, oh, Neverland's so much better designed than Monster. Like, they're both kind of Labyrinthian uh, worlds, but Monster at least knows it's a Labyrinth, whereas the Neverland ship, I don't think, realizes that it's kind of confusing to get through sometimes, so... And, and I'd rather be kind of uh, exploring uh, a whale's intestines than, like, the same brown pirate ship rooms, so I, I definitely see the, uh, the argument there. And yeah, like, the, the tension between Sora and Riku being, like, the center of this world is really kind of unmatched in terms of, like, the, the interpersonal relationships between characters in a Disney world throughout the entire series. I think there's some interesting BBS stuff later on with TVA, but because that TVA relationship is kind of weaker than the Sora and Riku one by each point in their respective games, um, I tend to value the Sora and Riku uh, crossover here a bit more. I can't call it the best Disney world just because of kind of how relatively short it is, but I would argue that, like, it really does integrate itself into the main story. You know, if you look at my Disney integration essay, it's one of the top four there for me, so... Um, very good work there by Carl. Yeah, story integration, I think that Neverland in KH1 is a little bit better. Mm -hmm. I think Sperry Paranoids is a little bit better. Mm. I think as far as the world design, I think places like Symphony of Sorcery are a lot better. Mm. And, you know, even things like Wonderland and, and some of the places in KH1 are a little bit better. Yeah. Though I would say that not too many worlds put those two pieces together. And I think that that's what the, the writer here is getting at, is that... It's kind of fusing the two things that make a, right. a great Disney world and, and putting them together. And maybe Monstro accomplishes that uh, a little bit better than than most of the other worlds. So yeah. it is unique in that way. I don't know if both of those parts are like individually strong enough for me to say that it is the best Disney world in the whole series. Mm -hmm. But it, it's definitely a, a fair argument that's defended well and, and yeah. it is pretty hot. From yeah, it's scorching. This is yeah. the, I, you know, Carl's the first person here to suggest this, um, so you you can't not you know and you can't knock it for for scorch points. I will also say like which was touched on here, um, getting to see like uh, Pinocchio and Geppetto like be stranded in this whale. Like obviously it's playing on what happens in the movie, but like the way that that's contextualized into the overall grander cage one narrative of like the ongoing apocalypse like yep. it's just you really feel the weight of the the ongoing situation in monstro um, it's kind of a reminder after getting comfortable with these kind of like insulated not insulated but like more self-concerned disney worlds than usual so i think uh i think that just really hits hard once you get to that kind of middle point in the game and get reminded oh yeah like people's lives are being like thrown apart and like they're reuniting and they're like floating around in space like as it's kind of gnarly shit so including um, monstro himself yeah is a character more than a world <laughs> that's true so. yeah yeah, the whole displacement of it all is, is pretty powerful, I think. Yeah. Okay. Uh, moving along. All right, here comes an anonymous take. Cage 3 Combat has more depth than Cage 2's, even ignoring the Remind DLC. There are a lot of improvements Cage 3 made to the Cage 2 formula, and a lot is taken from other past games, combined and improved upon. Cage 3's more interesting level design now affects combat encounters through gimmick set pieces and environmental interaction, as well as more balanced flow motion from DDD to make each fight more unique. Cage 2's dry forms have really cool unique movesets and can be used freely, but are heavily restricted by requiring that your teammates are alive. BBS's command system adds unique play styles depending on your customization, are really addicting during combat, and the finished commands add a sense of finality to each form. But being forced to activate or use finish commands can be really annoying. Both of these have been combined into K3's form change and situation command systems. You get the fun of building up the gauge to get different commands or forms, but you don't have to activate it right away. Honestly, I think the reason people think like that is comparable to how people used to prefer KH1's combat over KH2 when KH2 recently came out. Fans have more time playing an old game more than a new one, so they notice less of the more subtle details and complexity, especially when they are 
are good in different ways. Cage 2 had a 13 year head start over Cage 3. While there is more appreciation towards Cage 3 now, I feel people credit a lot of it solely toward the Remind DLC or even mods, even though the foundation of the base game contributes a lot more than they think. So I can only hope that in time more fans start to learn and appreciate Cage 3's combat more. Or maybe when the next Cage game comes out and people hate it because it's kind of different, then they'll suddenly start liking Cage 3. So I, I like the, the ending there. Yeah, the ending really works. Um, here's the thing. I When it comes to, like, which game has, like, the deeper combat, I just, I'm never really given a shit. Yeah. You know? It, it's, it really comes down to, like, uh, what's the most fun. Like, for me, I find the Cage 1 combat the most fun. It's definitely not deeper than either of the other ones, I don't think. Um, I think it definitely makes you think a bit more about positioning than maybe other games, at least maybe on a casual playthrough. Cage 3 having more depth than 2. Like, I agree with a lot of points being made that, like, the drive forms are awesome, but it's, it kind of sucks that you're, like, at the mercy of, like, Donald not dying in one hit to anything. Um, <laughs> I hate the BBS thing of, like, being forced into a command style or, have, or being forced to use a finish command. That's very annoying. Um, I do think the form change system is really fun. I do prefer the form changes over the other uh, drive system. And I think there is something to the idea that, like, uh, people are just harder on the new game and are maybe a bit more lenient towards the older one. I mean, obviously, the Tide... I, I do remember, you know, back looking on GameFAQs when I was, uh, you know, in grade school, um, people were not as goo goo gaga for Cage 2 as they were... Um, as they are now. You know, back in the day, they were like, oh, press X to win. Like, that was the... I mean, people said about Cage 1 as well, but I think Cage 2 really got, like, the brunch of that sort of criticism. And press Triangle to win as well. Right. I heard a lot of that Yeah, yeah, for a while. absolutely. It's definitely true that like three has more environmental set pieces that uh, maybe works with the the combat mechanics a bit more cohesively. But um, you know, for me, it's like gimmick set pieces, reaction commands. Like I don't really care about either of them that much, so I don't know if I'm gonna weigh one more heavily than the other. I don't know. Like I, I think this is definitely um, you know decently well argued, but uh, I'm probably more invested in the monster take there. And I feel like I hear this. Like I feel like you have the cage three versus cage two bickering a lot, and it's just like you get to hear both sides of that. Whereas the monster thing is a lot more unique and uh, probably a little bit better argued. And I do, I do think that like people act like Remind like saved this broken game, like it elevated Cage three from a four to like a nine point eight. Save those thoughts. Because okay. Because <laughs> we've got a little bit more of that coming up. Cool, cool. All right. So yeah, we'll advance the monster one there, but a uh, good effort. So the two seed here is that form changes are better than drive forms. Oh, okay. And the seven seed is that Remind is overrated. Oh, wow. So we were really just, uh, what, a, what a segue. Yes. It really is just a good sequel to that take. Yep. Okay. This is an anonymous take here. Form changes are just built-in auto drive forms that are more naturally integrated into gameplay than quick command menu navigation. They aren't overpowered, they allow new players to see different keyblade transformations and vary the base combos. They're a natural progression from command styles, except that it doesn't lock you into one ability after turning the next attack into a finisher. The ability to swap keyblades and stock transformations offer up emergent gameplay situations that weren't possible in Cage 2 and BBS. If this was a standard in Cage 2 and drives were in Cage 3, people would still complain because it robbed them of their quickly accessible power. Ooh. Spicy. It's pretty spicy. I mean, yeah, it's, uh, I am inclined to agree, you know, as we were kind of uh, briefly touching on with that last take, um, I do find the, the command, the form changes to be more satisfying and less frustrating to get to than the drives. They make you work for it a little bit more, whereas uh, Cage 2 and the command style is just like, all right, do this thing enough times. I mean, I, well, is that not fair? Because I guess in Cage 3, you just like hit something enough times to build it up. Like yeah. really, I guess the commonality is with KH3 and BBS, you have to hit something over and over for that bar to fill, but with KH2, you just, if your drive bar is filled up when you go into any particular fight, you kind of just have that at your disposal. Is the bar invisible in KH3? Like, do you know when the form change is going to happen, or is it just like two and a half combos and then it'll pop up? I think you can see it, but you know what? It's like the little white transparent arrows. Oh, uh, yeah, right, yeah, right, right, right. At the top of it. So it's not like, you know, you can like see the bar rising in real time. It's just kind of like after you hit certain thresholds. Right. Um, I think just having, like, you can just go into any fight with your drive gauge maxed out to like seven or whatever, and then like just clown on anybody with, with final form or master form, you know? With BBS in three, you can't like go into a battle that you know is going to be difficult and like have that form change ready to go and might be pretty quick to build up that meter but with cage 2 as long as your drive meter is maxed out you can just like arrive to a data fight or whatever and just like you know burst out into final form and, and start clowning on people so and I, listen i think you know the drive forms are sick i think everybody does but i do think the form changes are maybe a bit more nuanced along with the ability to swap keyblades as this person said i think the only thing that i don't like more about the drive forms is the risk involved with it mm -hmm. i wish it was just a more like that anti-form wasn't a possibility yeah that I didn't have to worry about that. I would probably like them a little bit more. I, I do find them more 
satisfying to get because they're more rare. Yeah, it's harder sure. to get to the dry forms, and uh, I feel like there's more explanation for them happening as well, which kind of makes me weight them a little bit more that you lose yeah. the party member, that they drop out, and that that's kind of explained. Yeah. Even though Goofy stays in the scene when Valor Form is introduced, so it's like, wait, what's going on here? You know what I'm talking about when yeah. they're in the, <laughs> yeah. the tower, <laughs> yeah. and Goofy's like standing yeah, there. Yeah, it's like, why it's are you like, here, bro? Oh. Uh, well, you can, you can arrive to any cutscene in a drive form, and you know, yeah. you're probably, so it's, it's hard to. Sure. I, I think you probably just have to revert Sword back to his normal clothes to make it make sense. I clown. Yeah. I clown. <laughs> yeah. But for the most part, I like the explanation of the drive forms a little bit more. I like that they're, you know, a little bit more substantial. They do feel like like rare treats, you know, yes, as opposed right. to like you get, you get a free form change with every Keyblade, basically. Yeah. And they're a lot easier to get, obviously. Yeah, and some um, of them are repeated. All the drive forms feel very distinct yeah. from each other, and. You know, the form changes have a little bit less of that going on. And, and, and while they are very intense and cinematic, mm -hmm. and I appreciate that, and it definitely matches Cage 3 because it's a pretty cinematic game, yeah. uh, I think I still prefer the drive forms. Uh, so I disagree with the take. Mm -hmm. I accept that it's hot, and yeah. I think it's pretty uh, well defended here. But uh, from my perspective, the drive forms are a little bit more interesting. I want to touch on two things about the drive form before we move on. Anti-form being, so if the drives are definitely more easily accessible than the command styles or the transformations, the form changes, but there is like that anti-form there to offset it. Because it's so easily accessible, maybe there should be like a risk involved with that. You know, whereas like it would be really shitty if you could like build up a command style or a form change and then like you just get fucked with some like random number generator thing and you're like stuck being some shitty form. And the other thing is that I do think drive forms are actually more cohesive with like the messaging in a way. Like Sora is drawing on the strength of his friends in almost every situation with a drive form, right? Um, except for limit form, where he's like drawing on his past strength, which for some reason eliminates uh, your party members. But like drawing on the strength of Donald and Goofy, or both party members that you have out to, you know, gain inner strength. Like that is what is that if not my friends or my power given physical form in the game? So uh, I think that's, you know, uh, definitely a point in the column for drive forms. Um, so there's give and takes for both of them. You know, I, I'm again, like this is kind of nit like so nitty gritty that I don't know like how passionate people are getting about this take, but I do, I can appreciate both the pros and cons of that argument there. So let's check out Remind is Overrated. Hell yeah. All right, this take comes from Fruitoon. The Remind DLC is super overrated. I'll try to be concise. Everyone sings the praises of Remind as if it's the DLC to end all DLC, but I just don't get it. All it changes in the base game is adding a few challenges and or handicaps to tack on to the same experience. Remind even includes new cutscenes that fit within the base game, but for whatever reason, they're only actually seen in the Remind scenario, where they're jarring and out of place. But I digress. In actual Remind, way too big a chunk is just fights that we've already done. And they tease you with playing as other characters, but you don't get to play anyone for long enough for it to really matter or appreciate how they handle in combat. Explorable Scala is fantastic, but similarly, you have one mission to fulfill, Kyrie's Hard Pieces, and that's the end of it. Data greeting is alright, no complaints. The data battles are fine, but the least they could do is give us any payoff. They set it up as something seemingly important to the search for Sora, and you struggle and power through 13 intense bosses, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't help anything, Riku and company are just back to square one. Oh well. And then one more mega boss, and that's the DLC. So to recap, it's a post-game campaign in which there are a few reused battles and new characters slash settings we hardly get to use, data greeting, and 14 mega bosses, of which only one actually has anything to do with the story. I don't mean to sound like I'm bashing it, it's okay. Obviously there is cool stuff too, like the Guardians vs. Replicas fight, and I guess I'd rather have it than not, but it's just okay, and everyone seems to act like it's the single greatest DLC release in the history of gaming, and I really don't get it. And then shrug emoji. Yeah. Oh man, this one, this one's coming for me because I said that in my Remind reaction that I thought it was like the best DLC I'd ever played. And I said I might be being hyperbolic, and I probably was because I was just riding the high of all of those mm. intense moments. Like, I think a lot of it for me was less so the gameplay side of things. I think that tends to be a theme with me is that like, I'm kind of more interested in what's going on with like the characters that we've come to know and love for 20 or so years. Um, getting to see those interactions, like that uh, Guardians versus Replicas fight, like that is a huge part of it for me. Sure. You know, getting to see some of this um, final world, the time travel stuff get fleshed out a bit more, even though it did kind of end up muddying the waters a bit more there. But like, I don't disagree with anything Fruitune said here. Like, uh, 
you know, there is a lot of like reused stuff. Like you're doing those 13 organization fights again. Um, so that's not great. I agree that like the integration with the data battles into Riku and the Final Fantasy guys, like what they're trying to accomplish, like it's not that well done. Um, it really does feel like you just do it and then they're like, oh, it didn't work. Oopsie date. Like there should be a little bit more pomp and circumstance to that, I think. Sure. Um, For what you have to do. Exactly. To it, you exactly. Know? You know, the Azor stuff is, uh, I'm indifferent to anything Azor at this point. Um, we'll see what happens with that moving forward. Um, Explorable Scala was a huge uh, point of, of praise for me. Still is. I still really enjoy that part. And I think when you when you contextualize this as like, how much did Remind cost at launch? Like, what was it? 20, 25 bucks? Yeah, yeah. Something like in that range. I think it's definitely worth that amount. Um, but is it the best DLC? Is it maybe a little bit overrated? Yeah, probably. And I hate to say it. Like, I think my mind is being changed a little bit. Like, at least on the gameplay side of things. Like... And I know a lot of people would probably take issue with that because, as we just mentioned, they think Remind fixed KH3 yeah. with those kind of smaller um, gameplay adjustments. Um, Which I really didn't even notice a lot of Yeah, the because time. we're not, like, crit level 1 guys. Yes. You know, like, obviously I've played them that way on stream, but that's not, like, how I first or primarily like to experience the games. So maybe that's just stuff that kind of flew over our heads because we're big, dirty casuals. Yeah. But, um... Yeah, I, I, I kind of really like what Fruit Tune's saying here, and not just because he's a $20 patron. Did you know that? <laughs> Man, are you... Uh, Listen, are you just here's, favorites, here's the know? thing, dude. I gave you 84. Some of the patrons happen to be in there, and they just happen to write some of the good takes. I deleted all of the names when I was That's true, it, he did. So this is blind for me. Plus, yeah. I don't know who pays this man. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Um... Yeah, I mean, Fruit Tunes is really making me rethink the Remind stuff, um, and it's it feels more substantial of a take than the uh, the form change and drive uh, form stuff, so I'm probably going to advance the uh, Fruit Tune one there. Good Sounds job. Sounds good. All right, so let's move on to what I think is the spiciest of the, oh boy. of the four quadrants of the bracket here. The number one seed here is the drop system is DDD's best gameplay <laughs> attribute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh my god. Choking on that, on that hot take. Okay, that is spicy. And the eight seed is Birth by Sleep is underrated. Okay. I mean, listen, I've heard that one. I've never heard the first one. Yep. Really interested to see. Maybe this will just change my life. I, I would say I've been playing Dream Drop on stream recently, but as anyone who's been watching knows, I've, you know, kind of put it to the side to play KH1 to restore my sanity. Um, but let's check out that, that drop gauge take. Yikes. This is such an uphill battle. <laughs> very, very uphill battle. All right. Soulfish says, The drop system slash drop gauge in Dream Drop Distance is one of, if not its best attribute gameplay-wise, and it contributes to DDD having the fastest pace, not necessarily the best, though, combat of the entire series. Not only are you not only are you gathering all the finest wheels. Every time I see not only, I think of fucking of an envy. Not only are your normal keyblade swings faster in this game, but as you progress, you start to learn more combat abilities like sliding sidewinder slash crescent and payback raid. And from the start, you get access to fast, hard hitting flow motion attacks such as kick dive, sliding dive, and buzzsaw. On top of having faster moves, you are constantly on a time limit, forcing you to approach battles with the mindset of how do I end this as quickly as possible so as not to waste more drop time. It gives a very Majora's Mask like vibe, being on a universal time except this time it doesn't involve death if you run out. It also encourages grinding. A really good main game strategy in DDD is to play a level through with one character and simply use the rest of that drop time you've got after completing a world to grind. This not only gets you tons of experience, but also gets you tons of drop points to give bigger buffs to Sora or Riku. The drop gauge is there if you want it, but it's also very easy to take advantage of. Drop knots are absolutely broken and pretty much let you have full control of the drop gauge, so if you use them when needed, you'll pretty much never drop randomly. Hmm, I already have thoughts about that, but I want to finish the take. Yep. It forces you to think on the fly by quickening your moves and presenting a timer, but it's also incredibly versatile and something that you can work around if you so desire. I really don't understand the complaints about this mechanic when drop me knots literally exist, and again, they give you borderline full control over the drop gauge, filling it up by half and fully resetting your drop speed. Really, the only criticism I have with it is when it forces you to drop at the start of Sora's World and Ever Was, since it's much easier to finish Sora's World and Ever Was first, as if you do, Riku won't have to worry about a drop gauge for the entire rest of the game, very much useful since Riku has three endgame bosses in a row before the finale with young Xehanort and AVN. I really hope this mechanic comes back in a future Cage spinoff like game, maybe one with actual revenge value. All right, well, I do like that we're, we're uh, dunking on Dream Drop at the end there, but okay. I like the angle. It's a valiant effort. It sure is an uphill battle. Yeah. It's hot. I don't hear this, except if you're Keynote, I guess, but he's deranged. Um, you know, <laughs> invoking the name of Majora's Mask, that's pretty clever. That's a, it's a nice, it's a tricky move right there. My thing, though, is, like, 
If we're going to prop up how intense it can feel and how we have to approach these situations thinking, well, I might drop, so I gotta, how do I end as quickly as possible? And then to remind me that, oh, there's an item that you can use to invalidate all of that. It's like, you, I don't think you can have both of those things. You right. know what I mean? You either have an item that you can use and it, it, it eliminates the, the, the issue entirely, or you have to approach these situations very strategically minded to get through it. I think being in a boss fight and getting kicked out of a, getting kicked out of it because of your drop meter is garbage. It's should just pause i don't mind dropping randomly i mean it's not random obviously it tells you it's going to happen but like the fact that it can happen at a boss is is just bad i don't mind it happening when you're out in the field grinding or just doing you know typical first time world campaign stuff when you're fighting mobs or whatever the fact that you have to put your drop me knots into your deck and you can't just use it from the menu is super aggravating and frustrating i just don't know if it adds enough for me to ever want to see it again or for me to still not hate it like it's it's a, there's good arguments being made, but like I feel like they kind of conflict with each other at a point. Like what I said about the strategy versus oh we'll just pop a draw me now it's not a big deal. Like you can't have both of those things. If the take was it's not that bad, I think it would be a little bit more acceptable. But to call it the best feature of the game yeah. on a gameplay level is a little bit. It's much, a bit much, I as Dom might say. Yeah. Yes, I mean. I think flow motion is better than the drop gauge, and I don't even like flow motion. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know, same. Uh, I think it breaks everything. So, but I think at least it's fun and flashy, and it's like the hook of the game. Like, I just don't know what is really being added by randomly getting kicked out of a character. Like swapping at will, I get the appeal there. I don't understand why taking agency away from the player, unless again you're saying, oh, well, it forces you to approach these situations in a, in a different way. It's just not worth it to me. Yeah, you know? it's the inconvenience more than anything interesting going on. Yeah. I, I don't know. If you didn't have to restart the boss battle, if it kicked you out mm. of the boss battle, and it was a little bit more jarring when it just dropped you back in it, and like maybe you forgot exactly where you are, yeah. like I feel like that would almost be more interesting. But yeah. then it makes you restart your task is like such a pain in the it's ass. It's terrible. I mean, I, I get like having to like you know take responsibility over your gauges and your stats and everything as you're approaching these these uh, fights, but like it happened to me on stream like. I went into Wargoyle on critical level one. I was finally getting the hang of it, and then because I didn't check my drop meter and it wasn't fully, it wasn't fully uh, filled, and that I didn't know that the weather system was in effect to make it go two times faster or whatever, is like I finally was getting my footing here, and I just, it's it's all for naught because of the fucking drop gauge and the fact, like like you said, that it's not going to drop me off there once I get back to that character. It's going to make me restart. Like that's inexcusable to me. Yeah, um, it's bad. I don't know. I don't know why anyone wants to <laughs> defend it. To be honest, like yeah. this is like. Is that never? I think once it happens to you, you'll never go back. Right. Like I don't, I don't think Soulfish has ever been in the situation <laughs> where I maybe maybe Soulfish has, and they just don't care as much. But I was deeply offended when that happened to me. So there are some interesting DDD takes in general in here, but as a justification for the drop meter, I don't know if it's there for me. Like yeah. the part about like the order that you do the world that never was and stuff like that and kind of streamlining that. But again, that feels like you're working around yeah. this very bad mechanic that yeah. we're trying to justify as something good. I don't know. Yeah. I'm not sold. I'm well, not sold. Well, we'll look at the, uh, is this the one versus eight? It is. Oh, eight might, might, might be the one here. I don't know. Oh, boy. <laughs> so, well, it happens sometimes. Yeah, it so happens. We'll see. All right. So what is it? BBS is uh, underrated? Yeah. All right. Birth by Sleep is pretty underrated as a whole, and gets way too much shit. Like, everyone talks about the floaty combat or the spammable commands, but no one ever praises the fact that this game has actual level design. Like, there is a sense of verticality to the worlds, and that just makes them feel so much more alive than in a game like Cage 2, for example. Great areas that show this off well are Radiant Garden with the Fountain Area or the entirety of Ven's Castle Dreams Visit. Not to mention that this game has some good storytelling and some interesting innovations, like shot locks or the D-Link system, which by the way, D-Links are hella cool. Sure. You can use them as a free heal like Drive Forms, but if you're playing on critical mode, you practically need them to help survive the early game. This little paragraph has been all over the place, but all of this is to say that there are other important aspects to a game than just its combat. In level design, presentation, and storytelling, I'd say it's a great game. The combat isn't even that bad anyway, it's just not a mainline game. Lol. Lol. Uh, <laughs> listen, I have always agreed with this take. I do think it, it is still the hotter take. Like, I feel like people fucking hate BBS, even though they liked it when it came out in 2010. Yeah. It's uh, like, when the remi- I, we know why people stopped liking it. Yeah. But when the remixes came out, I think maybe because it was, you know, a PSP game being translated to PS3 and 4, um, you can kind of see. But like, when it's on the same disc as Kingdom Hearts 2, 
it's just it's never going to sure you know add up and like as someone who just you know apparently shits on cage 2 all the time and hates this game like i think cage 2 is a more solid and fun to play game than bbs and overall more uh more interesting in some spots but bbs certainly um in terms of the overall like disney filler section of it i'd rather play the, the bbs disney filler than the cage 2 one I, I mean i'd I'd rather play through it three times as all the different characters than play through Sora's Disney filler one time in Cage 2. Because yeah. characters are g coming across each other, they're, they're in each other's paths, they're talking to the villains, they're, uh, Xehanort has his hands in several pots there, so it's just like, it's it's more interesting um, on a first time playthrough for sure for me, um, and even on a, on a replay. Um, the level design is definitely knocking Cage 2 out of the park for me. Um, at least, like uh, this person, as Yusuf says, it has some verticality to it, it has some interactable elements with its environments. Um, I do think D-Links are pretty underrated. I do, uh, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, budget summons, like it's obviously not as fun or interesting as getting to actually bring the character there, but to kind of like have these command decks that are built around that character to kind of showcase their, their vibe and personality, I think that's really cool. Shotlocks were introduced in this game and they have been the mainstay ever since. I guess it's not fair, Shotlocks have only been in 3 after that, right? Yeah, I think yeah, so. Well, but they, it was good enough to include it in 3 um, after a couple of games off. You know, I, I think there are a lot of people saying that, like, more people are saying this about BBS, so it's not as hot of a take as the drop gauge thing. But, like, I just think it, I think it's more well argued. Like, I don't think this is getting in the way of itself as much. And no disrespect to Soulfetch at all. I just kind of am stuck on the, the drop me not versus strategic planning point of it all. Yeah, I mean, this is less of an uphill battle, but it still stays hot, you know? Yeah. Because Birth by Sleep has kind of had a weird trajectory in how it's been perceived. I mean, it yeah. was solid until it wasn't, and now it's kind of having a little bit of resurging because the yeah. voices are changing a little bit. True, it's, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so it's having something of a renaissance, I think, just in the, the general community. I think people are, are digging it a little bit more, yeah. so uh, I don't know, this feels a little emblematic of some of that sea change yeah. that I think is happening. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, to go back to the combat, I would certainly rather play any of the mainline games over BBS. Um, so I'll get you know I'll give all the naysayers that, but like I, I don't think that's a huge W to be honest. Like I, I think that's that much is obvious, and I think to uh, I think it's unfair to BBS or Days or Dream Job to like really like truthfully put it to the you know like grill it on the gameplay level because they were designed for handheld consoles in the first place. Yeah, they were never um, meant to be on the same disc as Cage Two and right. Cage One and, and yeah. those. So. so. I'm gonna move this along. I'm gonna. It's gonna be a big upset, eight over one. But I like it. Yeah. I like it. I just can't get behind the drop gauge thing. Like it's hot, but as I said, like you gotta convince me a little bit. And um, overall, I just think this is the energy that we need in the bracket moving forward. A little bit of BBS love. Totally. All right, we've got another absolute scorching take. Okay. Coming up here. But first, let's take a <laughs> let's take a detour yeah, here really detour. quick. Okay. Yes. All right. So let's go to the four seed actually. Yeah. The command menu has never been good for the game. Wow. Or the series. Okay. You know, the HUD. Yeah, the yeah, there. like the thing that has all the information on it. Yep. Okay. Versus dives being better than the gummy ships. Okay. Kind of a two smaller scale. I mean, I mean, the command menu is not very small scale, but we're talking like gameplay elements right now. Sure. Um, very interesting. Okay. The command menu has never been good for the game. Okay. Let's see. This is an anonymous take. The command menu has never been good for the game. While having a real-time action game with a JRPG-like command menu adds a lot of flavor and personality to the games, I bet the command menu is the reason why some people call it an RPG in the first place, its benefits are outweighed by its downsides. Let's look at Cage 2, in which you always have plenty of tools at your disposal. Since brevity is appreciated, I won't go into detail, but it would be possible to map every single action available so that they are always at most two button presses away, and you could even map switch target actions to a single button press each. As I mentioned in my lock-on video recently, that'd be very nice. Uh, freeing up the D-pad is that important. Of course, navigating the commands during battle can create hectic situations and be a desirable challenge by itself, and I think this would justify the use of the command menu by itself, if not for the fact that you can't jump with the command menu open. This baffling design decision means that using the menu while fighting is extremely limited and clunky. Oh, it's the C word. If we sacrifice the D-pad in the command menu altar, why can't we just use left arrow to cancel? Interesting. I've never heard anyone say that the command menu is uh, more bad than good. I don't have a ton of thoughts on that, to be honest. Like, I, I'm just like trying to imagine any of these games without the command menu. They're saying you can remap magic to like a, a single button. Right. Like, I don't know how. Like, how do you have seven different magic spells and then you're gonna use one button to activate like a different button for each spell? Is that what they mean? Or like, I, I don't really know. Like customizing what the actions are on the side. Like, you can pick cure as one of your four options there. Yeah. Like that kind of thing? I guess. Like, are you still holding the L1 and then, uh, like, picking a button there? 
without the command menu though like right. does the command menu not just like streamline that though like i don't know i'm just like like i'm trying to picture playing through one of these games without having that little thing in the bottom left right it and, is hard to picture yeah. first and then imagine how it plays yeah without that it, it feels almost kind of limiting i feel like the command menu gives you a lot of options to kind of shift around so yeah. even though it takes a little bit longer i feel like it's most of the time worth it, whatever you're trying to find in the command menu, when you do find it. Yeah. I mean, I I don't know. Like, I've never found it so inconvenient because of the shortcut yeah. option. Yeah, and it could know? be because we grew up with it, but, like, I, I don't think it's, like, a huge barrier of entry to people getting into the games, you know, and nowadays. It's also been improved over time, too, yeah. because now you can put the potions in the shortcut menu right, and stuff right. like that. So And the summons, too, actually, yep. in KH3. So I think there's a lot that you can do with the command menus at this point. Yeah. You know, I, how late we are into it. It's definitely a take I haven't heard before. Ironically, they said brevity is appreciated. I would have liked to have seen a bit more talked about here to really, like, explain, like, the button mapping stuff and, like, how, how it could have been more convenient um, with this, um, this hypothetical situation. I think it, I think it does do more, more good than harm. Like, I, I just feel like envisioning these games without that kind of informational help at the bottom. And again, I don't, I don't know how, like, how hot, not that it's not hot, but that it's like, who's arguing over this? Right, right. Um, so I want to see this next take before well, we move let's on. Let's take a look at dives and gummy ships. Okay. This take comes from Solfege. Dream Drop Distance's dive mode is infinitely better than the gummy ship sections in any of the main games. The dive mode is not only a quick and easy way to get into the worlds, but it's also incredibly fun. The gameplay is simple and concise, and the music really gives the feeling of soaring down. The hero's grand ascent to save a world from sleep. All the missions are really fun and well designed, prizes are placed in a way where it's easy to reach the goal, but risky to get the goal faster. I love the themes for each dive too, how every dive is based on the world you dive into. It always annoys me that the gummy routes have no world relating theming whatsoever, except a tiny bit in Cage 3. Dives are simple, fun, actually theme themselves based on the worlds, and the bosses are super fun to learn despite being easy. And like I said, dives are also much faster and less time consuming, and not as hard as the perfectionistic people think to get A ranks on dives. It's a very good balance between freedom and linearity, you're free to dive at your own pace, but you've still got a mission to do and the obstacles to avoid. Have I mentioned how much the music slaps? The music slaps, like seriously, both the regular dive theme and the boss dive theme are some of the best in the series. Did I mention the music slaps? It was mentioned. I really hope the dive system comes back. It's fun, doesn't overstay its welcome, and it's probably the best part of DDD. Soulfish with another dream drop take. This one I am more inclined to be convinced by. And again, Soulfish is a little uh, hyperbolic. Oh, wait a minute. Didn't Soulfish say that the drop gauge was the best part of dream drop? Yep, and now we've got this here. <laughs> I don't know. Your story's changing. I definitely prefer the dives over the drop gauge for sure. Totally, yeah. Um, and I think moving forward with the series, especially, like, I do think a dive might make more sense, especially if, like, we're always talking about, like, if this KH4 is going to be, like, a split campaign sort of thing with, like, maybe more traditional KH Disney locations on the Realm of Light side of things with, you know, D&G, Riku and Kyrie, Mickey, whatever, and they're maybe using the gummy ship and maybe Sora has, like, maybe more dive-esque things in Quadratum to get to whatever he's doing. I don't anticipate that Sora's just in Quadratum. So I would think, like, a dive into some kind of live-action property might make more sense for Sora in the KH4. I, I think the point about the theming is excellent. I think uh, it's, it's a total waste in both 1 and 2, and for a lot of 3, that... Uh, there's no theming in the gummy routes to connect to the worlds. Like the like a soulfish says, there is a little bit of it in three. Like depending on what world you're near, you can kind of see some aesthetic uh, qualities from that world like emerging from it. But yeah, they're they're short and sweet. Um, the only thing I don't like about them is like I don't fully understand like how they're being contextualized into Dream Drop. Like where are Sora and Riku launching from? Where are they before they launch into a world? Whereas with the gummy ship, it's all contextualized through space travel. Um, it's something that the series has built up since Cage One has been consistent with this whole time. Whereas, like, the dive is just like, hey, let's just, you need a thing to get to the world. Um, it's, it's like a gummy ship light experience. I'd rather do a dive than a gummy ship route in any of the games, I think, just because they're shorter and more concise and themed better and um, just faster paced overall. And I think people are maybe reluctant to think about this one just because it's something that's only been done once, whereas the gummy ships have been with us this entire, the entire series. Yeah, there is some stuff to like about the dives, no doubt. I, I never really gave them much thought, but now that I'm seeing it all written out, like, I, I think there is some value there. And yeah, I mean, as far as the theming, like, it would have made more sense in Cage 1 than anywhere for the theming to kind of 
uh, match the the world that you're going to yeah. on the way there. Especially because, because the, the apocalypse situation. Yes, yeah. the world should be like breaking apart. Yeah. There should be fragments of the world. It's kind of like end of the world. Yeah, like that's or zero point two stuff. Yeah, sure. Uh, but that's all I really have to say. I mean, I never gave the dives much of a thought, yeah. but here they are now, convincing me that they're solid. So. Yeah. I think uh, to make up for Solfege uh, getting destroyed by the 8 seed, we'll move this one along. I feel like the, the <laughs> drop take was a troll now. <laughs> yeah, do you think so? I'm concerned. Maybe Solfege was like, all right, here's my real take, and then we'll just see if they take the bait on this one. And I guess taken. we kind of did. Yep. All right, here we go. Three seed here is that Cage One has the best camera in the franchise. <laughs> Even I don't know about that. Holy one. fucking shit! Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> Scorching. Yeah. The six seed is that Recoded is the best suited game for the console that it's on. Okay, interesting. Yeah, uh, Cage One camera thing. That's a sweeping statement, one that I haven't heard before. Um, all right, let me take a look at that. All right, this comes from Hamburger Splash. Cage One has the most effective camera in the franchise. The camera is often the most maligned aspect of Cage One, but I think it serves both the gameplay and the atmosphere of the game wonderfully. The camera in Cage One is quite low to the ground and physically closer to Sora, which was changed in later installments, namely Cage Two, Dream Drop, and Cage Three, to have the camera be higher in the air and move further away from Sora. The height of the camera in Cage One contributes greatly to the immersion. Large bosses like Darkseid, Cerberus, and Dragon Maleficent are made to feel much more menacing and imposing, since the low camera positioning accentuates their size compared to Sora. Contrast Cage 1 Cerberus with Cage 2 Cerberus. The Cage 2 character model for the boss is slightly smaller, but the higher and wider view of the camera renders him extremely unintimidating compared to his Cage 1 counterpart. You know, I've always thought that. Yep. So it's, it's nice to have that uh, brought to words, which I've never been able to find myself. The camera's closeness to Sora also serves to immerse the player. In Cage 1, only enemies in Sora's direct line of sight and immediate periphery are visible when the camera is positioned behind the character, aligning the player's perspective directly with Sora's perspective. The player can then rotate the camera, albeit better in the HD versions of the game, the same way the player can move Sora's body. In Cage 1.5, you are effectively controlling Sora's body with the left stick and his eyes with the right stick. This is in contrast to later installments that pull the camera back significantly, revealing to the player only enemies behind Sora or out of his field of view that he would have no way of literally seeing. This creates a disconnect between the player and Sora that breaks immersion. This more omniscient camera placement in later installments positions the player as a figurative god and Sora merely as a puppet controlled by the player, rather than aligning the player and Sora through a shared viewpoint. This damages the overall atmosphere and psychological slash emotional way of combat and boss battles in the franchise's later installments. Fuck, this is Fuck. so good. I really, this really so like good. that. I mean, I, because I've had, I've had this thought this whole time. Like, what is it about KH1 that feels so much more intimate? and like involved like you just feel like you're there more than the other games even cage 3 which i love even cage 2 which is my number three game like why is it that you just feel like you're there more and it's, it's it can't be because of nostalgia i played cage 1 when i was six i played cage 2 when i was like eight yeah, <laughs> you know right. so it's like you, you can't even make that argument like there's just something about it and the way that hamburger splash phrased this is just so good even though it's what was this seated uh three yeah this should have been like it should have been a point two <laughs> you know like this is fucking zero point not only is it so hot but like i am blown away by how this was explained to me like this is so good and what people are going to say when they hear this like but clunky though but i get caught on stuff sometimes okay. but you could pretty much either have clunky or floaty yeah like take your <laughs> yeah i've said this before i remember saying this a couple of years ago yeah. where like part of the reason why the floaty thing comes up so often is because the camera is so pulled back yeah. in all of the games besides KH1. Yeah. And yeah, actually recom actually. Yeah, true. The camera is pretty tight in that one too. Yeah. Those are the two least floaty games and the camera has a lot to do with that. So yeah. this is putting into words pretty much that, yeah. that thought there and expanding on it and doing it better than I probably But I've seen ever anybody could. ever do. Yeah. I mean, I could do. The, the the idea of like moving the body with one stick yeah. and moving the eyes with the other is just yeah. I mean, that's top notch and I mean, analysis that, and, there. Yeah, so. and you could say that about a lot of games of this era that are coming into their own as a series like when they're shifting from 2D to 3D. Yeah. Um, you could probably say that about, like, I don't know if Ocarina of Time, I can't remember how an N64 controller works right now, but, like, right. this is not, you know, I, I wouldn't credit KH1 with that. Um, I don't think there's any one game you can credit with that, but it's definitely a great way to put it. Um, just how Hamburger Splash phrases, like, the alignment between Sora and the player um, and making that immersion feel more real and having it be more, like, more detached and omniscient in, in other games um, definitely, I think, weakens the atmosphere, like Hamburger Splash says, so... Um, yeah, I'm in love with that, and it's, it's all hot. being said, I, it is very yeah. hot. I don't always know if this is the part of the camera that people are arguing about. No, but, they never are. But, but making this 
the case for it being the best, yeah. this feels right. This is a good justification. I mean, it. when people complain about the camera, they're not being like, oh, I'm too close to Sora. They're saying like, oh, it gets caught on stuff. Right. Like it's it's weird to to use, which I think is a lot of carryover from just when they played it originally on the yeah. PS2 when it was the the shoulder buttons. Yeah. But nowadays it's the modern like like they say here the stick. And I, I really don't have problems with it. I don't really have problems with the camera in almost any game on, in the series at this point. But I do I do think like there's just there's more to be gained from a tighter camera like that from an atmosphere perspective than there is from moving it back in the other games. So right. All righty. This take comes from Frosty, and I hope you have a snack because it's a <laughs> chunker. It's 495 words. Yeah. Right, right. to the limit here. Yeah. Recoded is the game that's best suited for its handheld console. When one thinks about the handheld Kingdom Hearts games, you have Com, BBS, 3D, Days, and Recoded. Recoded did the most with the console it appeared on. Chain of Memories is a beautiful game that set the stage for the organization, but it was marred by difficult to read card numbers if you weren't on a backlit screen, and a wildly different yet same combat style. Days had a huge impact on the Kingdom Hearts story, but it suffers as it is a wholly 3D action game without an extra thumbstick. Levels and areas become repetitive over the course of several missions. Similarly, Birth by Sleep, for all its hard-hitting story beats and influence on the series, was a PS2 game, but small. Small with an O. BBS limits your areas to small rooms with minimal characters, giving you little to interact with. 3D has an absolutely broken flow motion system and hides your abilities behind gotta catch them all Nintendogs. The only advantage it took of the 3DS was for reality shifts and petting your giant purple T-Rex. But our golden child... I can't believe you're making Kiwi say this. (laughs) This is burning me. But our golden child, Recoded, started its life as a humble phone game that somehow ended up as the most suited game for its console. Let's think about what the DS was as a console. It was a continuation of the Game Boy line meant for short play sessions. For example, one might bring the DS on a train or the bus to school. Its clamshell design made it easy to transport without harming the screen, so it was inherently carryable console. Recoded consists of short missions similar to Days. However, for each world you visit, the game offers unique play style changes that complement the more familiar large room with enemies. Side scrollers in Traverse Town, rail shooters in Wonderland, and a Final Fantasy combat style in Olympus keep the content engaging and fresh in bite-sized portions for easily achievable goals. Tying it all together is the stat matrix. As you make progress in the game, you unlock new abilities and customizations for Sora. The game makes handy use of the dual screens to show the matrix on bottom and how it affects your stats on top. Additionally, the stat matrix also lends itself to these short periods of play. When you complete a challenge to unlock new stat matrix abilities, you feel a sense of accomplishment that your short playtime meant something and that you have more to look forward to the next time you play. Recoded is not the best Kingdom Hearts game, nor is it the best story game. Much of its story is largely inconsequential, but where it lacks in story content, it shines in gameplay, using the DS to its fullest extent, building on what Days laid down before, and thereby surpassing it as the Kingdom Hearts game best suited for the console it appears on. Whew. But my counterpoint is like, who cares, you know? Yeah, right. All right, moving on. All of it means no, nothing. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, you know, obviously I give Recoded a hard time. I haven't played it uh, super recently. Um, I definitely had my qualms with it. What Frosty's saying, I think, is true, potentially. My my thing with Days is that I think the mission structure, even despite the thumbstick issue, like, I think it is better suited for, like, short-term bursts of, of playing. Like, I think a lot of people have memories of, like, doing exactly what Frosty's describing about Coded, but with Days, like, playing, like, a mission or two on the bus to school or on the commute home. Like, I just, uh... I, I, this is one we run on stream as well before. I definitely think it deserves to be here. But I just don't know if, like, saying that Recoded is, like, best for the DS is, like, that big of a W for it. Like, it, we're not even limiting it to the DS. Like, Frosty's saying, it's the best Kingdom Hearts game for the console that it appears on. Well, that kind of eliminates, like, anything that appears on, like, PS2 or 4 because they're just, like, home consoles. Like, there's no gimmick to a PlayStation console. Sure. You know? Whereas the DS has two screens. So that's, like, inherently a more gimmickable console than something that, like, a like a PS4 or an Xbox One or whatever. So, like, it's it's potentially true, and I, I do like what Frosty's saying about, like, the different play styles. Um, you know, it definitely does does have short mission structure like days. Frosty did convince me on a lot of the, the better aspects of Coded, and maybe I do need to give it a, a more fair shot on stream sometime. I just don't know if it being the best 
uh, game for the console it appears on is like something that really anyone's talking about. Like I don't know if that's like an argument in the in the fandom at all. Maybe it's being shit on a bit unfairly. But it's also going up against that camera take, which I really, really like. So no offense to Frosty, but I do think I want to move the, the Hamburger Splash camera take forward. Sounds fair. But I don't want to say anything about Recoded. Yeah, so yeah, I got gotcha. you. That's all you. He hates it even more than I do. But, you know, very, very good effort from Frosty. There. I, I hated that dies in round one, but, like, it really went up against something that kind of uh, put put word, put word my thoughts to words over struggling with that for, like, 20 years. So... All right, here's that scorching hot take that I oh, okay. uh, referenced earlier. That cage to Atlantica is not that bad. Oh, That's that was a- that was literally the example I provided for, like, argue this if you want a hot take. Don't say something that you just think is true. Say something that you can argue and also that you never hear anybody say. Yep, and somebody so. brought the heat. Okay. And the seventh seed that it's going against is that Kingdom Hearts should not be considered a crossover. Interesting. Okay. I unironically liked Atlantica in Cage 2. I swear I'm not making this up for the forum. I genuinely enjoy going through it whenever I replay Cage 2. It offers a nice change of pace from the rest of the intense combat and story happening in the other worlds. Intense story in the other worlds? They mean like World Never Was and Hollow Bash Twilight and Town. Twilight Town? I couldn't help myself. The fact that it has to be done over episodes gives it this nice sense of temporal realism and scale. I do like that. The music gameplay is simple but satisfying, making it successful in acting out its role as a break. The newly added songs may be basic, but the songs from the movie are good and even have the added appeal of including STG. I also like that, and getting them integrated into the... I know I'm like stopping down during this take, but I do like these points. Mm-hmm. It's undeniable that one of the main appeals of Kingdom Hearts is the absurdity slash surrealism of Disney and Square characters inhabiting the same space, and our lovable main trio of Sora, Donald, and Goofy singing Disney songs and dancing to them with Ariel is peak absurdity and surrealism. At the very least, it's funny and amusing, and really, who doesn't like himself? Some Finny Fun. How do you feel about Finny Fun, Kiwi? Uh, I've defended some Finny Fun in my day. I could take it or leave it, but... It was I'm short. not nuts about it. I'm not it. nuts about it. I do like a lot of points here. Like, if you if you view Atlantica as something that you, you just come... Like, you're not supposed to do Atlantica in one shot. I think a lot of people do because they just don't want to do it and they put it off. Yeah. And then they realize, like, there's a bunch of shit you can get from it. So they, like, do it all, like, towards the end of the game. But, like, it is kind of intended to be, like, a reprieve from everything. Um, I do like that SDG actually do get to interact. Like, Let It Go could never in KH3, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, this... If we're talking about musical integration into the series, like, you put Cage to Atlantica over both of the songs they sing in Arendelle, especially fucking Build a Snowman. Mm. I mean, that's just bad. Yeah, it's really bad. Like, they implemented there. A lot of people focus on Let It Go because it's, like, the whole, like, CGI movie thing with, like, two clips of Sword Dawn and Goofy in there. Yeah. But, like, the at least... The talking over Do You Want to Build <laughs> yeah. a Snowman is bad yeah, on the that, sound that level. It's terrible. It's, like, sensory overload. And yeah, like, is Kingdom Hearts, like, is the germ of it not, uh, like, this, well, we're gonna go up, up against this other take, is it not the crossover appeal? Um, like, SDG just, like, hanging out with Ariel singing Disney songs, like, is that not peak Kingdom Hearts in a way? I think there's an argument there. I mean, th- this is pretty good. It's short, but sweet, and I think it, it makes some good points, so. Totally. All right, this take comes from Catherine Perrin. Kingdom Hearts really shouldn't be considered a crossover. A crossover should feel like both sides are being represented and working together. Sure, there are both Disney and Square Enix characters, but Square Enix characters feel more like cameos at points, especially after 2. And these are explicitly alternate versions of these characters. Nearly all of the guest party members are Disney characters. There's never been a Final Fantasy world or a Final Fantasy Princess of Heart. At points it feels like they used Final Fantasy characters instead of designing original characters. I'm willing to bet that had the Twilight Town group been in the first game, they would have been Final Fantasy characters instead. Also, Disney owns all of the original Kingdom Hearts characters outright, not Square Enix. Honestly, it feels more accurate to call Kingdom Hearts a Disney game with a Final Fantasy overlay, but that's not as marketable as calling it a crossover. Yeah, I mean, especially as the series has gone on, like, I think KH1 probably has the best claim to, like, this is the Disney and Final Fantasy crossover. And right. even even then, it's still pretty light, you know? Yeah. You get the Traverse Town stuff, but which is already set in an original world. You get Cloud and Sephiroth and Olympus. And that's really kind of it, you know? Yeah. Like, you, you get these cameos, you get the Moogles and whatnot, and it's, I don't know, it's just... Uh, crossover is the word that gets used like i just used it when i was talking about the atlantica take yep. but it really is probably not the best word to describe it i mean it really is as as catherine says here a disney game with a final fantasy overlay so i, I agree with all this um it's definitely changed my opinion or at least changed my vocabulary i think like i think it's kind of incorrect to really still be harping on this in 2022 that like oh, where's the crossover element like it really never was like i guess they internally they did advertise it that way and maybe that was kind of misleading, but um, I think we're, we're kind of just past that in the series at this point. So, right. 
feels like an older take that's still hot, but it would have yeah. been a little bit hotter in 2003 or yeah. something like that, yeah. you know? When that imbalance first became apparent, like, we're, we're very much past the conversation, I think. And so I think it is interesting for semantic yeah. reasons. It, it probably does not uh, hold up mm. especially well now, especially that we've had a game that has no Final Fantasy at all. So it's yeah. really lost that crossover appeal that maybe it had in the first place. Yeah, I mean, I even, even before Birth by Sleep, you could be making this, and it would, like, 2008, 2009, like... I mean, Days didn't really have any of it either, to be honest. So, right. like, really, it's like KH1 and 2, a little bit of BBS with They're Zach. doing the heavy lifting of the Final Fantasy. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Orin in, in Olympus in KH2 is peak integration there for sure. me. If you want to point to a crossover element, that's it right there. But, and then uh, Remind, and it's oh, kind yeah. of just, like, thrown in. And I don't know, I, I always really enjoy the role that Leon and his gang oh, yeah. kind of play. But, you know, it's not... They're so glory days of past. Yes, yeah, right. For sure. So I like this from Catherine, but I'm, I'm probably going to uh, advance the Atlantic one just because I think it's it's spicier. I don't know how many people are arguing over the semantics of the, the word crossover, um, but I do think this is something nice to keep in mind moving forward when we uh, talk about the games. All right. We've reached our final quadrant oh of God, the bracket here. The whole quadrant left. All right. So the one seat here is that Final Fantasy characters weren't really needed in Cage 3. Okay. More, more of a segue there. Interesting. Yes. Yeah. And the eight seed is that Kingdom Hearts writing has never been good. Never even been good? Oh no. I mean, it's not great. Let's take a look. All right, this take comes from Tyler Tylerims, who actually appeared on the Kingdom Hearts Union feud recently. I think even though KH is founded on the basis of Final Fantasy crossing over with Disney, that the Final Fantasy characters, at least the ones we have now, are meaningless and irrelevant. In KH1, we learned that they were cast from their world when the darkness took over, and by the end, we reclaim their world for them. In KH2, they're working to restore the world, and by the end, it is back to being Radiant Garden. Their story is done. Cloud and Sephiroth are always the enigma amongst the Hollow Bastion gang. In both cases, where Cloud and Sephiroth confront one another, the fight's outcome remains unresolved as they fly into the sky. I think their exclusion from KH3 was a good decision, as they were unneeded and would basically add fluff. Pretty short and sweet from Tyler, but I'm inclined to agree, and, uh, I mean, the needle kind of moves there for me, like, I, you know, I'm not one of those guys that, like, played Cage 3 and was like, oh my god, where's Leon? Like, where's Yuffie and Cloud and Sephiroth? Like, I was like, oh, that's weird that they're not there, but it didn't, like, take seven points off the game for me. But, when you really think about it, like, I don't know what you give them to do. Like, even in Remind, like, it didn't have to be them in Remind. You know, sure. it, it only was them in Remind because they decided to set it in Hall of Bastion, or Raiding right. Garden. If they set it in Twilight Town, it would have been Hainer, Pence, and Olette, you know? There's, there was really no need to have them. I don't know what them as characters add that Hainer, Pence, and Olette, or Ansem and the Apprentices could not have added themselves. Um, so, Yeah, I'm pretty much in lockstep with Tyler here yeah. because I didn't really give a shit that they were missing when Cage 3 first came out and that they got added in in Remind was fine, but yeah. it was not something that I like needed. It was not like this massive revelation. It's like, oh, now the game is good, like we were talking about before. Yeah, right. Like it, it didn't need that, and so... Uh, I don't know. Like, people talked about the Final Fantasy characters as if it was, like, this long-held tradition, like, going back to, like, the 1600s. But it's, <laughs> right. like, there's two fucking mainline games. Yeah, like, yeah. it's not like it's been built up, like, this, right. this crazy thing. The same thing with, like, the Hundred Acre Wood. People were yeah. talking about before the trailer dropped about how, you know, oh my god, it's not going to be a mainline Kingdom Hearts game if you don't have the Hundred Acre Wood. Right. It's like... Motherfucker. And There's they... been two mainline <laughs> games that like we've seen so far. Like yeah. what are you talking about? Well, it's yeah, not like it's... this crazy tradition or something. Yeah, people people they get so stuck on like the pattern recognition of it all. But maybe it's just more so a coincidence that some things are in one and two and then not in three. You right. know? The pattern's not like that. It's set. not established yet. Yeah. Yes. I mean Right, like, I think you just see, I mean, obviously, in 1 and 2, the Final Fantasy presence is, is obviously higher than what you get out of Remind in 3, but, like, we had basically a decade of very late Final Fantasy content building up to that. Like, they're comparing it to the mainline games because it has the, the number 3 in it, but, like, you compare it to BBS and Days and Recoded and Dream Drop, like, there's really not any Final Fantasy stuff going on there either. Sure. Like, Dream Drop has the World Ends With You to kind of offset that a little bit, but um, it's been something that the series has not really been concerned with since you know, you finished the game in 2006. So, yeah, it's it's a good point. And um, it kind of changes my mind on how I approached that when I got done with KH3. For me, I was sorry they weren't there, but I don't even know why I was sorry. Like, it, there really was no place for it. They're kind of done. Right. So, again, I would like to see Cloud and Sephiroth, like, get a final showdown and, like, Cloud, like, finally vanquishes him, but uh, maybe they just, they're just going to drop that. I mean, it's been so long at this point. You know, who cares? <laughs> There's all this other Final Fantasy VII media you can watch if you really want to see how that plays out, you know? Sure. So... 
Okay, this take comes from Liam. I enjoy Kingdom Hearts' writing, but it was never good. There's more problems than I have room for, so let's get cracking. Oh my god, he's down to business. Yeah. <laughs> cracking the knuckles. All right, Oof. let's go. Ooh, nice knuckle Yeah, crack. it was pretty timely, yeah. All right. One common mistake is repeating a limited set of terms constantly, sometimes within a sentence of each other. Nothing against hearts and darkness, but their mystique quickly gives way to buzzwords. I've gotten editor's notes for less. It also recycles narrative structures between worlds and games, with days being a nice exception. Even with so many properties and OCs roped in, Cage struggles to come up with new themes to discuss and struggles even more to effectively use old characters. I see Roxas' prologue as an exception, but it's a surrealistic tragedy that's just rare. It's also my favorite sequence in the franchise to the degree that I'd isolated as Cage Lone's example of truly great writing in a niche genre. Speaking of the surreal, Cage has issues with its cryptic writing. Writing a mystery plot is good. Writing an opaque plot that demands viewers pay attention can be good. Having villains show up constantly to stand around and spout taunts, motives, and straight up lies is not good. I would love to tell you things about every main antagonist beyond them being sinister and knowing all that there is to know, but well, describe Marluxia without saying his jobber <laughs> goals, manga scenes don't count. KH1 Riku was the best villain the franchise ever had because he changed over time. Here's some seasoning for a spicy take. <laughs> More people would be able to get into later Kingdom Hearts entries if they had more interesting hooks. It's the job of a new installment to stand on its own merits, and the KH narrative uniquely does not function without all its details. Only one way to solve that, introduce something truly new and don't tie it to all that's come before. Some meaty setup right at the beginning for a new character arc would be nice, especially if it can include subtle world building instead of exposition. Having a tangible, fresh plot, the power of waking was aligned between two points. Running through the Disney worlds would go a long way towards solving filler complaints. I can mention other things, like how Kingdom Hearts' stories feel too focused on making more questions than answers, and explaining everything else in obsessive, yet arbitrary ways, or how Xehanort's true motive could have been introduced before his last fight, and then questioned to cathartically expose his villainous hypocrisy. However, I'll skip to my last point. I enjoy Kingdom Hearts' writing because I can't tell when <laughs> it's being funny. The twists it thinks are smart and the lines it thinks are impactful are often ridiculously cheesy and that's the wild ride I send up for. Kingdom Hearts is, like the recent Stranger of Paradise, an awkward barrel of laughs. I'd love to see it do better, but since I'm acclimated to it, I can still have a good time. You know, I'm really glad that Liam ended with that last paragraph. Because anyone who's, like, trying to argue that Kingdom Hearts is, like, high art or great writing is, like, wasting their breath, you know? Yeah. That's that's not why I'm here. I'm not here because of, like, the intricate plot lines that, like, weave effortlessly into each other. Like, I'm here because of the emotional attachment you get with these characters, seeing them interact with each other, seeing them, you know, be torn apart from each other and get to be reunited. Like, that's the core of the series for me. So, like, the premise for me is, like, are people out there arguing that, like... Kingdom Hearts has great writing. I guess some are because they've not consumed any other media. Sure. Like Kingdom Hearts is my favorite video game series, but like it's not the best written video game series that I've ever played. You know, right. I don't know off the top of my head what that is, but like this is a tricky one for me because I think it's a stretch to say that it's never been good. Like I think great maybe. I don't think it's ever been great. Like uh, Liam says here, the Cage Two Prologue, very good stuff. I think a lot of Chain of Memories is actually very good. Yeah. Um, I think we're kind of sleeping on that. Um, I'm not super impressed, but KH1 is very simple. I think we're going to get into that at some point. Um, KH2's after the prologue, like, I'm not that impressed by a lot of it. Um, even KH3 on its own is whatever. Um, dialogue, I think, is quite good in KH3. Oh, dialogue is the best in KH3 out of any other game. Yeah. Maybe maybe except for, like, GBA com. I don't know. Um, I think Days has some kind of artful stuff to it, but maybe yep. a bit too prolonged. It could have probably been truncated a bit. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the stuff that happens in the Kingdom Hearts games that are, you know, slightly insightful are kind of still directed towards, like, a teen audience. Yeah. Like, it's something that people over 16 will probably not, like, find especially deep or anything right. like that. I mean, but there's still value to it, though. I mean... Yeah. Like, I, I think... I think when this when Liam says like the lines it thinks are impactful are often ridiculously cheesy, like I don't think those have to be mutually exclusive. Right. Like my friends are my power. I think is impact like cheesy, yeah, for sure. But like there's some truth to it, and I think it's impactful, and I think it still kind of holds up. Sure. Um, as like the mantra of the series, like I think that's what most people would point to as like a cheesy line that the game thinks is impactful. But I think it's right to think that it's impactful because for me it is. Um, it worked on me as a kid, and it still kind of works on me now. Maybe I'm just small brain, but. 
It could be that, but it might also be true. Yeah. <laughs> That's true, yeah. Uh, what Liam said about, like, the villains, like, I totally agree. I don't mind when the villains straight up lie, but I do think a lot of them just stand around and spout their taunts and motives. Um, but, you know, like, Marluxia, like, I don't know what you say about Marluxia besides his job or goals. Um, it's true. And I do think Kei Riku is, you know, kind of leagues ahead of uh, a bunch of others that we see later on in the series. That being said, what wins? I don't know, dude. Final Fantasy characters, the KH writing has never been good. I think the Final Fantasy characters one is a hotter take. I do, th yeah, I do think it's a hotter take. Like, I think the people inside the fandom, I don't know how many of us think like, wow, KH is just really killing it with the writing. Like, if you're like me, you kind of just accept it. For, I think if you're like Liam, you accept it for what it is and you enjoy it regardless. But I've, I've never cared about the game strictly on like a... Uh, like a literary, artistic writing perspective. Like, it's just not what it is. You can tell from the cover that's not what it's going to be, you know? So it's almost like, you know, why are we wasting our time trying to argue one way or the other? But people on the outside of the fandom really, really like to bully it. Oh, yeah, um, definitely. It is a popular take outside. Like, people who play the three mainline games and then make YouTube videos about it, a.k.a. the most insufferable section of the human race. <laughs> like, <laughs> Oh, those people. Yeah, yes. those people. Like, they, they think the writing is bad, and I, I guess they just, I don't know if they have higher expectations for it, but, like, look at the fucking box art, dude. Sure, you know, like, is there. You kind of just know what it is before you put it in. Yeah, it's a little absurd. So, I expect that. I really like what Liam said here, and people are going to be like, oh, he can't accept that someone's criticizing his favorite game. It's just, like, I just don't know how hot, like, I think the Final Fantasy thing is hotter, and that's kind of what we're trying to do at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, this is all stuff I've heard before as well, which is, I mean, even though it's so eloquently written, um, I, I just don't know if, like, really the needle's being moved for me at all. Like, I've kind of you know, considered all this already. It's definitely putting my thoughts to words in some spots, but again, I'm not trying to argue that this game is high art. I don't know who is, so I'm going to move the Final Fantasy thing along. But very good work from Liam. Like, it was very well written, and I appreciate that. All right. Let's take a look at the 4 seed here. That KH1 story is overrated and awkward. <laughs> okay. And the 5 seed is that Roxas, Shion, and Namine should never have gotten their own bodies. Oh, wow. Okay, this is anonymous take, and it's a good thing, too, because this person is trashing my little, my little baby of a video game. The story of the OG Kingdom Hearts is overrated as all get out. The Maleficent plot is superfluous as fuck, only there to give the veneer of relevance to Disney World's while in actuality, essentially acting as filler, while you get the Ansem secret reports that contain the actual story that leads up to the main villain, and every Disney villain below Maleficent can't even manage to have that veneer of relevance. The simplicity of KH is not tightness of narrative, but rather the consequences of the story being limited to a 10-page Google Doc written by Jemmanuel Cricketus, and awkward symbolism that falls apart until later games actually put narrative momentum into them. Even the fact that the Ansem reports are optional drags down the story, having so much of the emotional weight robbed by the what is is happening to Riku? Why is he getting angstier and more muscle suity rather than fully comprehending that this is him losing control to Ansem? In all honesty, KH1 has one of the weakest stories that barely holds up to any critical analysis in KH, with great moments often falling apart if you analyze the metaphors that make up the world. Like, why does the ultimate act of sacrifice lead to Sora becoming a heartless, falling to darkness? Why does Kairi restoring Sora to light then mean? Is Sora sacrificing himself to be read as him letting darkness into his heart, or is it meant to rely on the world building that so far can't even solidly pin down what darkness in a person's heart is? or even if it is a thing in the world or a designation for a vibe in the heart. Huh. Listen, there are good points being made here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I, I do think, and it's interesting about the Anson reports, um, how they're, I, I always liked that they were optional because it was, <laughs> what? <laughs> Why are you laughing? Germanial Cricket. Oh yeah, Germanial Cricketus, yeah, that's good. I kind of always liked that they were optional. It felt like you were being rewarded for kind of looking into stuff. Some of the, like, you couldn't, you wouldn't even get some of those reports if you didn't, like, play through every single world and, like, do optional fights and stuff. You get some of them from, like, Sephiroth and Unknown, I think, right? You get, think you get 12 and 13 from Sephiroth and the Unknown. Yeah. Um, so I always kind of like that, but, like, it is true, like, you are losing a bit of the complexity by, like, relegating so much of that and some stuff to the reports. And yeah, like, I, I do think, like, the light-darkness metaphor stuff is kind of muddied. Like, why does Sora sacrificing himself make him a heartless? Like, I know, it's like, on a metaphysical side of things, like, we know what that means. But, like, but mostly from the other games. Like, within the context of just KH1, like, why? Like, why does Sora making a sacrifice, at least from a narrative perspective, lead to him becoming, like, this monster, like, this grotesque being of darkness? Right. Um, it's not something that fully makes sense until you get to those later games. And it kind of muddies itself within the confines of KH1. And like, yeah, what does it mean when Kyra restores him uh, to light? I don't know, is the Maleficent plot really superfluous? I don't I, think so. I, th I think that's a bit of a stretch. I like, feel like it's leading Riku down a certain path that's, you know, getting him closer to Ansem. But is Ansem really involved in every single thing? I mean, leading up to that Hollow Bastion scene, 
where they finally encounter each other. Yeah. It feels more like Maleficent leading him that way, and then Ansem strikes after he's been led down this path for a while. Yeah. I don't know if it's completely pointless. I mean, I don't know if the other Disney villains were ever supposed to, like, seem especially relevant beyond their world, other than them appearing in Hollow Bastion. I mean, it's just that they're in cahoots with each other. I don't think that they're ever supposed to show up in another world than than they wouldn't otherwise, besides Hollow Bastion. Uh, I don't know. I mean, some of this I feel like can kind of come back The second half I feel better about. The uh, the Maleficent plot, I I think... uh, I mean, sometimes simple is good. I think the stakes are established pretty quickly with KH1, and they stay consistent up until that that like final eleventh hour reveal. And I think the Maleficent plot is pretty important in getting you there, like you said, sure. with getting like leading Riku down that path. Does it really have one of the weaker stories, though? I mean, and is that KH1's fault? Like, if something got retconned in KH1, like that's not to blame on the the game that started it, though, right? Mm, I mean, yeah. this kind of happens in everything, like. Is it the pilot episode's fault? Like, when something happens later on that kind of invalidates some parts of it? Right. I don't know. I mean, I have a hard time blaming Kingdom Hearts from 2002 on something that Kingdom Hearts 3 in 2019 did wrong. Yeah. Or, you know, retconned or something like that. So, I don't know. Does it hold up to any critical analysis? I mean, most of the things are still relevant, if that's what you mean. Yeah. I mean... Is it, like, completely disjointed? I would say that it probably is not. I mean, it tells a pretty simple hero's journey at the end of the day. I mean, it's not going absolutely bonkers. And they use some of the same terms, and some of the terms are vague and don't really mean anything. But, like, I don't know. It's not extremely hard to follow. It's a light and dark thing. It's one person on one side and other people on the other side. And the person on the good side is trying to take them out. I mean, it's not... It's Star Wars, you know? It's like... It's not so overly complicated that, uh, that, you know, it just falls apart on, like, any reading of it. In that case, like, every hero's journey probably falls apart then, because most of them all hit these same exact beats. I'm not the first person to say this, and I won't be the last, but, you know, it's not so easy to just, you know, tear this apart. I mean, unless you're taking it extremely seriously, in which case, then you probably can't even get to Destiny Islands then because it's absurd from the beginning. Yeah. So, I don't know. I think that this is I mean, how hot relatively is it? hot. You I think mean, so? I like, mean, as far as like fans would say that like the OG Kingdom Hearts probably has like I one feel of like the fans stories. love the Cage 2 story. Like I think the typical Kingdom Hearts fan like likes the Cage 2 story more. Probably, they probably like it more, but I don't think they like think that the Kingdom Hearts OG story is that bad though. No. I mean, yeah, this, this person's saying overrated. Yeah. I, I think it's kind of the opposite where it's like people from the outside probably appreciate KH1 more as a story because it's not convoluted, quote unquote. Right. Yeah, um, be it. So, I don't know. I'm I'm kind of wishy-washy on like how hot this is. Um I, I definitely think there's some good points being made, especially about like the symbolism and the metaphor stuff. All right, here's an anonymous take. Roxy on a nomination never have gotten real bodies. I feel it ruins the impactful sacrifice they all make in their stories. And in fact, Roxas and nominees still get happy endings in Cage 2. They are whole with their true selves, and they can always have one another. I wouldn't mind if Shion was remembered, and maybe Roxas and Namine could be voices in Sora and Kairi's heads. Their sacrifice showed that the Cage series could be more mature without getting edgy. Nobody's are a doomed existence, and that's tragic, and it hurt, and that's good. However, nobodies could still have happy endings and return with their true selves to be whole again. I felt like with concepts like this, the series was growing older and teaching their audience about concepts they may be content with. Loneliness, feeling like you don't exist, and how you may feel like that sometimes, but you can still become your true self. Whew. It's brutal, right? Yeah. It's pretty brutal. Um, And I, I definitely see the appeal to both sides of this, right? But like, I just, I'm always coming back to like, how mature do we want this game to get that features the Disney characters fighting alongside your main protagonist? Like, I just don't know. Was it not, is Cage 2 not the edgiest game in the series? It probably is. It's either that or Days, right? Well, Days is like a little bit more angsty. This one is probably pushing the boundaries of its like edginess the most. There's a little difference there, yeah. Like, I just feel like even in Cage 2, like I feel like the universe had already been established at that point that it was like a forgiving universe. That like people get second chances. Sure. Like Sora gets a second chance in KH1. Like he sacrifices himself and he gets brought back because of that. I just don't think Kingdom Hearts was ever a series that punishes, you know, morally good characters with like eternal damnation or not having autonomy or just like dying at the age of 14 right. after only having existed actually for like a week or two. You know, like uh, I guess Roxas for a year. 
I just don't know what we want out of the series if we're, like, saying that, like, wow, we should really, like, kill off these characters that did nothing wrong. Like, I get the appeal. Um, I think Kingdom Hearts can do dark and it can do edgy without, like, just removing a bunch of pieces from the board. In a way, it might have been better because I feel like they don't know what to do with a lot of these characters in the present arc, you know? Like, what are they going to do with Roxas and Nominate moving forward, if anything, you know? Right. Maybe it would have been better if they were just voices and sword in Kyrie's heads and to keep them around. Maybe that's not as intense. Maybe it kind of softens the blow a little bit to have them as you know, like, uh, their own little Jiminy's in a way. Um, I, I don't know. Don't they seem kind of satisfied with that fate, though? Like, there's some closure to that. Yeah, Rondis and Nominee feel like they're good with it, which is true. Um, if Daze's whole purpose for existing and Roxas and Nominee never came back, but if, like, if Daze only existed to kind of, like, highlight the tragedy, what was happening with Xion in the background of mm -hmm. all of this, and, like, at the end, there was some kind of flash forward where she was remembered, like, if it had, like, more of a split kind of timeline, yeah. and in one part it showed the story, and in the other half it kind of showed trying to remember who she was, yeah. I feel like that would have been a little bit better. Mm. I don't know. That's reframing a lot of the stuff here. I mean, the impact of this right here, like, yeah. if everything just ended in Cage 2, like, I feel like that would have shifted a lot of the, the plot of the series to come, but I, I, I kind of like the take I, though i'm just like so, i'm just so torn on it i mean like i feel like i weigh the emotional heaviness of that final cage 3 scene with everybody together again right like more than how much i could get out of the series being a bit darker and more yeah mature. makes sense i yeah. just i just i just feel like it's almost inconsistent with what the series had been up to that point when they got rid of those characters to be like right. they'll never be back they're dead maybe they'll have you know they'll, they'll appear as voices i just yep i don't i don't hate this but i, I do think it's a hot take like and I, and I think there's there's a good argument being made here and uh, I do think it's hotter than the one prior. I think I want to move this one forward. Cool. Um, and not even because I'm a big KH1 baby. I just think this one's more kind of, uh, it's convincing me more. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, this is, uh, I think this is uh, I'm torn on it. Like, I, I feel like this one is really getting to me. Like, I don't know how to think about it. And I, right. I think there's some value there. Ooh, it's worming its way into your heart. Yeah, exactly. All right, moving on. All right, the third seed. The three seed yeah. is that Cage 2 has the worst plotline in the series. Oh, okay. And six is that Organization 13 is the worst thing to happen to the series. Interesting. Okay, I'll have Cage 2 talk. This one comes from Mig Masterin or at Mig Masterin 2 on Twitter. My hot take for the Kingdom Hearts series summarized in one sentence Kingdom Hearts 2 has by far the worst plotline in the entire Cage series, and I mean it. First of all, there was absolutely no reason for Organization 13 to make Sora an enemy. None at all. This is because Sora was already on board with defeating as many Heartless as possible, including the Emblem Heartless, only Heartless with an Emblem, release a usable heart according to Days. Not only that, they decided to reveal themselves in Hollow Bastion as some sort of power move which only further reinforced their position as a voluntary enemy, although I agree that the scene itself is awesome. Furthermore, several times they tried to actually defeat slash kill Sora, for example Zelda in Beast World or Demix in Hollow Bastion, which is weird because before visiting World of Never Was, Sora was known as one of the two people who could currently use a Keyblade, and good luck convincing Mickey Mouse to help you after striking down an innocent teenager. But we are not done yet with Organization 13, oh no. For some reason, Saix decides to, or was more likely forced to, reveal the grand master plan of collecting hearts in order to create a man-made Kingdom Hearts, which he does because... reasons? According to the game, this was meant to sow seeds of doubt within Sora, meaning that Sora was meant to reconsider whether to use his Keyblade or not against Heartless. It's just that, you know, Organization 13 knows full well that the Keyblade is the one and only item that can actually create the Artificial Kingdom Hearts. Saix actually points out to the other members that Sora will now be harder to control, but he is just brushed off. To summarize the first of three major points, the driving force behind the plot of Cage 2 is, of course, Organization 13. It's just that for some reason, Org 13 seems to be desperately trying to shoot themselves in the foot as often and as consistently as possible during the game. And remember, the Org 13 nobodies seem to be fully conscious and retain their intelligence from their human forms. With this knowledge, every Org member, except Xemnas, seem like they actually want to die because they lost hope so long ago, but they can't off themselves because Disney partly owns Kingdom Hearts, so we are stuck with this dumb plot instead. And before you say Cage 3D or any other Cage game had a worse plot, at least in Cage 3D, the antagonist had a well-defined goal that they nearly executed perfectly, namely turning Sora into a dark vessel, without telling everyone and their grandmothers well in advance what their plans were. Finn. Also, this is unrelated to the other stuff, but why does only Luxord have a ramp in the castle that never was? Did he lose a poker game against Xemnas or something? It's a good point. <laughs> we should talk about My that. Oh my god. No, yeah, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> anyway. Jeez. So, Cage 2 has the worst plot. Like, I know Big Master and try to, like, get the early rebuttal in and be like, you know, before we say 3D, but, like, okay, I'll just say recode it then, yeah. you know? Uh, Even oh. with all this, it's still 
better than Coded in 3D. Yeah, like, I, agree. I agree with everything, but it's still better than the pointlessness of Coded and just the the entanglement that is 3D. Yeah, I still would rather like Psyche a shooting himself in the foot. stupid antagonist yeah. plot than like whatever's going on in those. Two. I I agree. Um, I mean, this is like this is not necessarily something I hear a lot though. Like, it, it is it's interesting to think about like Psyche. Like, why are you telling Sora this, Psyche? Like, <laughs> what is to be gained here? Right. Um, but, like, I feel like it's kind of, like, the sort of cinema sins angle, like, oh, plot hole, you know, like, and then that really, like, I'm supposed to let that tank everything. Sure. And like, there's a lot of cool stuff happening in Cage 2 right. that I don't know if I can just throw out because of, like, the organization not being super consistent. But um, Sora still has to fight them, though, ultimately, yeah. so, like, I don't know... Like, they tell him that, but what's Sora gonna do? Like, this is approached in the game. Like, you still gotta fight the Heartless, or else everybody's gonna die. Like, you're gonna end up back in a cage one apocalypse mode. Yeah. So, it needs to be done. Yeah. Like, so it doesn't matter whether they say it or not. While it would have been better for them to just not say anything, even if you say it, it doesn't really well, change anything. It would be great if Axel would just tell him. Right. If Axel tells him, then you get to have that emotional weight of, like, Sora being like, well, I have to fight the Heartless, but, like, that's what the organization wants. Right. And also, it's not revealed but from somebody who would obviously benefit from that being a secret sure so if like if you just change that scene to it being axel then like half of this take goes away yeah it's a very simple fix interesting I, yeah it's uh it's something that i don't hear a ton i like it i just don't know if i can like agree with the initial premise of like oh it's the worst so. on the organization 13 topic let's look at the worst thing to happen in the series interesting yeah let's see all right, another anonymous take. Organization 13 is the worst thing to happen to the series. Okay, not the worst thing, but let me explain how they ruined making a compelling antagonist. The organization is so beloved, so much that everyone has their favorites. Their designs are cool and their motivations are compelling. Their deaths feel tragic at times. If I'm being positive about the organization, then how did it ruin the series? Well, for two reasons. One, the characters can't stay dead and have to be worked into the plot. The characters were good as villains, but now they're just bogging down the story. Story. I have to check in with the Enzo, which I personally love, but it halts the story, and give a redemption arc for Isa and Lee, basically ruining what made the characters interesting. And don't get me started about how Union Cross made backstories for Merlucia and Larksane. They were great villains, and now they just can't stay dead. And now for number two. The series has been trying to recapture the magic and make another organization, but just can't. Since KH2, the series has been trying to make a bunch of smaller players work for the main villain. Think the new organization with Xehanort, the Foretellers, and Lucio and Master Masters. Unfortunately, those characters just aren't as compelling. I'll take someone as boring but well-designed as Lexius over any of the Milk Toast Foretellers or Dark Riku <laughs> Replica, whatever his name even is. <laughs> The organization set the bar so high with compelling villains and villain design that the series honestly hasn't reached since, which I personally think has ruined the villains in the series going forward. Okay, well I feel like this kind of got muddied at the end, because we, then we start out with saying it's the worst thing to happen in the series, but not the worst, and then we're saying that they set the bar so high with compelling villains and villain design? Right. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like we kind of backtracked all the way back to them being good. <laughs> it's like, they were so good yeah. that, like, everything by comparison I guess. seemed like shit. Yeah. Um, it's kind of ties back into like why can't people just stay dead and lose their autonomy right um, which is not exclusive to the organization that happens with you know characters outside of the organization I personally think it's a good idea that Malusha and Larxian get backstories they're not incredibly they're not incredibly depthy oh, no. <laughs> in, uh, in Chain of Memories um, as we mentioned in an earlier take like what is Marluxia's whole deal besides his job in the plot um, same thing with Larxian like she's mean and she likes to torture people like I would like to know more about them I don't think that really ruins it it's definitely hot, right? Like, I think the organization is one of the best things to happen in the series, solely based on the time that it came out. Like, you released this game in 2006 at the height of, like, you know, edgy emo mania. You have all these fucking 13 of these guys in these dark cloaks with yep. fucking elemental superpowers. Like, that is just, it's marketing genius. For you know? marketing purposes, they were fantastic, yeah. really. But I guess I'm, I'm approaching that from, like, an external viewpoint. As is this. I think though, this is kind of right? tricky. Like, if you're saying, like, oh, well, they're so good that it's actually bad, like, I don't know. It's a little too cute for me. Yeah. So what's it going to be? What the was third the third scene? What was the first one? That was, uh, that Cage 2 has the worst plot line in the entire series. Oh, I don't really like that one either. <laughs> what um, was that? I don't really like that one. I think it, I don't think it's the worst plot line in the series. I guess I'm going to advance this Organization 13 one because I disagree with it less, I guess. Like, I get what they're going for here. Right. Um, and I think it's hot. In its roundabout with way. The cheeky answer. Yeah, I guess it's it's cute, but like I don't I don't think it's as like I don't know. We've been doing this for so long. <laughs> <laughs> I I think uh, 
Uh, remind me of what the one before was again. Yeah. We have one more, and then we get to speed run the okay. rest of this. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cage right. two plotline being the word. It just it's just not true. Like I just I, in no universe do I find that to be true when recoded exists. Yep. When Union uh, Union Cross isn't that coming up actually? Yep. Cux is in really fact, good. That's the next one. <laughs> All right. The two seed is that Cux has the best steer. <laughs> God, I can't even speak. Very good. Kingdom Hearts Union Cross has the best story in the series. That's okay. going to go against the seven seed, which is Maleficent is a better villain than Xehanort. Spicy. We're all spice. Okay. This is another anonymous take. Kingdom Hearts Union Cross's story is the best of the series. It gives characters like Ven, Zigbar, Marluxia, and Larxene even more depth that recontextualize their actions in intriguing ways, introduces new characters like the other Dandelion leaders with some interesting interpersonal conflicts and motivations, has some Kino scenes that desperately need a full-fledged CG movie to showcase, and has so many connections to all the other games that it just fits, even if we know Emers never had these planned from the beginning. Now that sentence is over. The revelations this game throws at you all turn preconceived notions about the series topsy-turvy. Dream Eater's origins, player Xehanor connection, even the freaking pods found in Hollow Bastion that never had any sort of purpose until now, and that's just to name a few, but in a way that makes it not just fun to theorize and speculate further, but the world of Kingdom Hearts feels that much more alive. Too long didn't read, back cover 2, movie when, I want my boy Brain's 4K high dev Dolby Vision glow up, send tweet. Interesting. Um, Cux is the best in the series, story-wise. It definitely gives characters like Ven and Zigbar more depth. Marluxia and Larxene, I don't really know as, like, I'm glad they are getting something, but it kind of gets wiped away when they reappear in Recom, at least timeline-wise, because of, like, the amnesia effect right. of it all. Like, does it really contextualize what Marluxia and Larxene are doing in Recom at all? Marluxia maybe a little bit, Larxene I don't, I don't think very much, because she doesn't get too much to do in, in Cux. Yeah, yeah, she's uh, hardly there. Yeah, and I don't think it really recontextualizes Ven that much either. Because I mean, other than the very end of Cage Three, where he gets to meet up with his his, charity, yeah. his stuffed cat. Again. I guess you're supposed to like you know that like you you do a BBS replay or Cage Three, and it's like okay, you actually know that Ven is like actually substantially powerful because yeah. um, he's like I guess one of the true light things. I again, it's maybe not fair that I'm reading this take because I'm not a big Kingdom Hearts Union Cross guy. I do think that like it probably gets more flack than it deserves. I, I can't bring myself to say, like, it's the best. Like, I have consumed it. Like, I have gone through Union Cross once, and I think there's a lot of neat stuff happening. Like, the Dream and Origin stuff, Player Xehanort connection. I think that's all cool. I mean, I don't know. Player Xehanort, I'm actually... I don't think I like that. I'm less excited about it. Yeah, I'm less excited. I think Dream Eater stuff is kind of cool. The pods and Hollow Bastion, I'm a big fan of that. There's It's a huge theory bait material. I mean, there's nothing better for theory, speculation type stuff uh, for the series than Union Cross. I mean, there's a value to that, just keeping the series alive and talked about in that way throughout that like continuous release. I'm glad that this person didn't attempt to justify any of the gameplay mechanics or the gotcha stuff, because that would have uh, not done well with me. So yeah, I'm I'm willing to you know consider this one the best. I'm having trouble getting over like the hy hyperball like like this is the best, um, but I definitely think it's probably slept on. Yeah, I think it elevates other stories in the series better than it tells a coherent story itself. Yeah, that is what I'd be struggling with there. It's hard when you have to go to a demo or Everglow video to really get this in a good order. Yes. You know, like, that's what I get hung up on. Like, you shouldn't have to watch, not even just because of the accessibility, but because of how the story is told. Yep. Like, it just seems like it's just not quite in the right order at times. It's a bit of a slog. And especially when it's text-based like that and it releases, you know, so uh, inconsistently. Sure. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I struggle with saying it's the best, but I want to hear this this final new take. But what about Maleficent is better than Xehanort? Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that one, yeah. <laughs> All right, here's Five Toad Sloth with Maleficent is a better villain than Xehanort. She didn't have to lie to villains to get them to join her. She <laughs> didn't have to parse out her soul to get underlings. She didn't need Ansem's help to get the seven princesses. And she would have succeeded if Ansem hadn't interfered and attacked Destiny Islands instead of just sneakily snatching Kyrie. His choice ultimately lost them Kyrie and unleashed Sora on the universe. <laughs> I guess, right? I guess that's true. Yeah. Um... But, like, only in the context of Cage 1 is this right, potentially right. arguable for me. What seed was this? This is a 7. Yeah, that seems about right. Not the Shade 5 Toad Slot, but I'm just saying, like, you look at, like, Malif if you want to say Maleficent Cage 1 is a better villain than Xehanort in Dream Drop Distance, I could give you that. Or that Maleficent's a better villain than Ansem in, in Cage 1. I might even give you that. Definitely, definitely. But, uh, I can't give you Malif like, Maleficent's body of work is so weak after Cage 1. Yeah. Whereas, like, I think Xehanort is really fun in BBS. I think the the kind of shadow that he casts over Dream Drop and 3, I think it just kind of 
puts him ahead of Maleficent. Yeah, definitely. Like, Maleficent is just so irrelevant, and... Uh, She's a net negative after Cage. Right, and if you're not taking the... Like, I take Xehanort seriously. Like, he's one of the few characters in the series that I tend to take seriously more often than not. Yep. Maleficent, I don't take seriously after she gets stabbed by Riku Ansem. Like, she's done after that. Yes. You know? So, I'm gonna move along the Union Cross point there. All right. All right, we're gonna try to speed through because this is a very long video so far, but we're in the, what are we in, the Sweet 16 now? Yep, and okay. now kids, we speed run. Right, because we're gonna, we we're go. not gonna reread through all the takes, we're gonna get the, the bite-sized version, yep. and we're gonna get to our champion. Okay. Maybe with a little bit of consideration thrown in, but. Yes. All right, what's our first round here? All right, you ready? Yes. Terra is not dumb uh. versus Anson the Wise, not that bad. I gotta go with Terra's not dumb. Uh, yeah. I, I think uh, it was more substantiated. Um, I think it's hotter, and uh, it's more personal to me, I think, with my experience with the game. So, move Terra along. It was a one seed, so it makes sense. Sora does not deserve to be a master versus Saix is the main antagonist of Cage 2. Oh, boy. So, my thing with the Sora not deserving to be a master one was that, like, it's definitely hot, but, like, do I agree? If Sora doesn't deserve it, then who does, right? Right. But... How hot is the Saix being the main villain of KH2? At the end of the day, I think I'm just more inclined to agree with Gavaka's position on that. I just think like it's it holds up better for me. I think it's not as hot, but I think like it does a better job at convincing me and potentially other people. Like I, I just can't be convinced that Sora doesn't deserve it if you're telling me that, that Riku and Aqua and Mickey all deserve it, you know? Sure. So I'm gonna go ahead with the Saix take there. Cage to FM plus critical mode yeah. is not the interesting or meaningful challenge everyone says it is. Uh -huh. Versus Arendelle is a well designed world. Oh, <laughs> I love both of these. They're both one seeds, are they not? Or is Arendelle like a uh, two or three? No, this is a one versus a four. Ooh, I think it's gonna be a bit of an upset then because that Arendelle take really is really good. Really um, over Cage I know, to FM plus critical I know, mode not being the meaningful think, and interesting challenge that everyone says that it is. I think the Arendelle, <laughs> <laughs> I think the Arendelle take is hotter. I think there's a bit of counterculture against Cage Two FM like worship. Uh, yeah. um, I think that's substantial enough that I'm more impressed by the Arendelle take at this point. So I am going to advance the Arendelle take, but they're both near and dear to me. Just want to say that I read that summary of that Cage 2 take yeah. without looking at the take. Oh, really? Take. That I was just impressive. like was eyes <laughs> It's so on ingrained you. now, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'll move the Arendelle one, though. But yeah. I love I love the, the Cage 2 FM+. Plus. All right. Monstro is the best designed Disney World in the series versus Remind is overrated. Uh now to clarify, it wasn't Monsters the best design. It was just overall. It's best. the best Disney yeah. World in the series. Sorry, best Disney Monsters the best Disney World versus Remind is kind of overrated. For me, Remind not being, I I think the the claim is a little too bold for Monstro for me. Okay. Like I just I just can't get behind it being the best. It's very good. If we were arguing Monstro integrates its story and gameplay better than any other Disney World, we might be onto something. It would still have to go up against, like, Space Paranoids. Right. But, um, I, uh, I think I gotta go with the Remind one there. Sorry, Carl. Oh, no. <laughs> Down goes Carl. Yeah. And that was, uh, who was the other one? Fruitune. Uh, nice. I remember, yeah. Oh, man. I remember. A couple of legends, though. Yeah. Both legends. All right. We've got Dives Are Better Than Gummy Ships versus Birth by Sleep is Underrated. Um, I think I'm gonna go with dives that are better than gummy ships. I think, like with the the Cage Two thing, like there's enough of a counterculture about BBS where you kind of hear that un often enough. Yeah. Where it's like you don't really hear the dive thing, and I really like the reasoning used by Soulfedge there, so I'm gonna Definitely. advance that one. Yeah. Yeah, it was well done. Yeah. Cage Two Atlantica is not that bad mm. versus Cage One has the best camera in the franchise. Oh uh, yeah, the Cage One camera one's going through big time. I mean, yep. it's so artfully written. Yep. I don't, I don't know if we're just, like, falling for it. Like, maybe Hamburger Splash is just, like, the best bullshit artist this side of the internet. But, like, oh, but did you see that take, though? It was did so good. It take? was so good. And the case to Atlantica one, like, there were points in there that I agree with, but it's almost a little too simple. We both knew about the camera one, like, while it was happening. Yeah. Like, oh, this is the yeah, shit. Yeah, like, okay. we were, like, leaning forward in our seats. <laughs> yeah. So. And that was, at, like, you know. That was, like, three hours ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All, All right. right. Uh, Final Fantasy characters weren't really needed in Cage 3 mm -hmm. versus Rock to Shion and Nomination have never gotten their own bodies. Yeah, so we have like the conflicted nature of the, the body thing versus like this overblown thing about Final Fantasy and Cage 3 and, and future games. Um, what's hotter? What do you think's hotter? Do you think the body thing is hotter? 
Uh, no, I think the Final Fantasy characters is extremely hot. It's yeah. a one seed. Yeah. It, like, stuck out to me on the page of, like, oh boy. Like, that's... That's something that nobody said in a while. What does Akma say? That's a phrase no one said in a long time or something. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess for me, it's just, I don't want to feel like... Because I, I agreed with the FF1 going into it, where it's like this this body thing is new to me. Like, I've not really considered it that much. Yeah. Um, so I don't want to feel like it's like biased, but I just I just feel like it is hotter, the Final Fantasy thing. Um, I'm just, I, I just haven't been able to think about the body thing for long enough to really hammer down my point on that. So, so I'm gonna, Final Fantasy? I'm going to advance to Final Fantasy, yeah. All right. Cox has the best story in the series versus huh. Organization 13 is the worst thing to happen to the series. Oh my god. I think I'm going to advance the Cux story. The story of the Cux. Yeah. Wow. Just because, you know, again, I, I wasn't a huge fan of either of the ones that that Organization one was up against. Whatever the... What was it against? Uh, oh boy, I've got to go back in time it's for fine. that. It's fine. Um, Just put it on screen. Yeah. <laughs> The uh, the K the organization one oh was the plot cage two plots not good yeah right um I wasn't like a huge on any either of those um but I'll probably go with the cucks yeah clean yeah so we've reached the elite eight elite eight time here we go Terra is not dumb uh huh versus Syx is the main antagonist of cage two I gotta go Terra's not dumb it's hot it's it's so true <laughs> sorry God vodka I got vodka it was a uh, valiant effort love you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For my biggest fan. That's right. Arendelle is a well-designed world versus Remind is overrated. I'm gonna go Arendelle on that one. Yeah. I just, it spoke more to me. It really, really convinced me of stuff that I was just blind to. KH1 has the best camera in the franchise yeah. versus Dives Over Gummy Ship. I gotta go with the camera one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I gotta go with the camera one. It's so well done. Final Fantasy characters weren't really needed in KH3 uh -huh. versus Cux has the best story in the series. I'm gonna take the Final Fantasy one. I can't let the Cucks people get too far. So we've got a one seed versus a four seed, and a one seed versus a three seed. Okay. So this is yeah, respectable. Well seated. Yeah. Well seated. Okay. So it's final four. Yep, final four here. Okay. Terra's not dumb. Uh -huh. Versus Arendelle is a well-designed world. Oh god. The grand poobah of hot takes versus this new thing that you're yeah. you're really excited about. I know. I do think Arendelle being a well-designed world is super hot. I know you ironically don't. hot. Yeah, ironically the frid the frigid tundra is a very it's a very hot. It would make a lot of sense in the championship. I just it think would, uh... now that the voices, you know, we're talking about the voices in the community changing. I think I think the general consensus is shifting to be more Terra sympathetic. Yep. Like 2010 to like 2016 was very like, wow, Terra's fucking stupid. Can't stupid, stand him. Stupid. But like yeah. I I very rarely see anyone like give any praise to Aaron though. You yep. know, I do see Terra fans out there. I'm one of them. I'm trying to lead that charge. But like, this fucking... And that didn't convince me of anything. And I think part of this exercise is to be convinced. And I did not have any good things to say about Arendelle prior to that cartoon buffoon take. Yep. So, the Terra not dumb take, I really, really respect it. I live by it. But I feel like the spirit of the exercise would uh, prompt me to advance the Arendelle take there. And it was very well read, so... Final Fantasy characters weren't needed in Cage 3 versus Cage 1 as the best camera in the franchise. I gotta give it to the camera one. <laughs> I mean, you know, Tyler ha made a great point very concisely. Um, Hamburger Splash made a great point and really got into it and really sunk his teeth into it. Um, actually, they're both Tyler's, I believe, so mm. curious. Um, curious. But yeah, I do I do have to advance the uh, the camera one. It's just it's so good. And I don't know what to do now, Kiwi. And, yeah. and finally, and finally... A city. A city. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta uh, throw that in for the deep cut fans. Yeah. Yeah. Cage One has the best camera in the franchise. Uh -huh. Versus, Arendelle is a well-designed world. <sighs> so really, we're getting down to like, what was this assignment here? Yeah. Because Cartoon Buffoon's Arendelle take convinced me of something, but Hamburger Splash took something that I've been thinking for a long time and I didn't know how to put it into words. And it's something that you're never going to hear. It's been famously held against... KH1 forever. As has the Arendelle, though. Yeah. Like, both of these have been... They're, they're, they are they're hit all the beats, you know? Yeah. They're both hot. They're both kind of yeah. not exactly on your wavelength. There's something that yeah. you haven't really said out loud before. Yeah. So they're hitting a lot of, you know, the beats that the project exists for. Yeah. You know? 
they're both very well defended, obviously. Yeah. Uh, we, you know, excited about both of them. I think the Airedale one's kind of been in our consciousness for a little bit longer. We didn't really know what was coming up with the camera one when we started today. Yeah. But. And they're both a little hyperbolic, right? I mean, Hamburger Splash is saying it's the most effective camera in the franchise. Like, I don't know if effective is the right... I mean, effective, it conveys, like, the atmosphere better than any other camera, right? Right. Um, and it definitely contributes to the immersion. And our Cartoon Buffoon's saying Arendelle is the best designed world in KH3, if I'm is a not well mistaken. Is well designed. Let me just check that. One of the best. So one of the best. So it's a little, little less hyperbolic, I suppose. Like, the hyperbole is really where I, I get lost on some of these. Like, we have to be measured. We have to be hot, but measured, you know? When we were originally talking about it, I said that your winner should be something that, like, you want to canonize. Yeah. Like, this is now the talking point. What do I really want to canonize between these two? Yeah. I really want to canonize the KH1 camera one. <laughs> but it's also something that I felt that I agreed with, but I didn't know how to express adequately. Besides, like, it just feels different. You know, like, I... I, it's just so satisfying to see that put to form and it's just so well written and i love both these guys these are both regulars uh on my on my twitch um it's a tie <laughs> yeah can we just can we all just be friends now i think i think i'm just and maybe this was a disadvantage for buffoon that we got to read this a couple weeks ago on stream and it's been able to simmer with me and i'm just so uh enraptured by this camera take but it's so high like i think it's hotter I think it's hotter, and I think it's just so well-crafted. I think I have to make the winner. KH1 has the most effective camera in the franchise. I think that's our winner here today. It feels good. I'm a well, KH1 slut, so it was always going to be a KH1 thing. I apologize. I'm trying to check my biases at the door, but I'm acknowledging they exist. And I just think it was a very well-constructed uh, take there. Both of them were, though. A lot. I mean, all 32 of these are very good. So... I've never read a review of Kingdom Hearts 1 that didn't at some point reference how bad the camera is. Right. And, and you so, can get through a KH3 review without hearing about Aaron, though. Yeah. So this is the take now, folks. It's the take now. Take this with Let's you. Let's talk about this on the streets. Ha! <laughs> take this Yeah, with take you. it with you. Take that take. The hot takes have now simmered. They've gone back to whence they came. We did it. We finished the bracket. This is three hours of recording, by the way. Three and change. We'll see how long it ends up being. I appreciate you if you stuck around for this entire thing. 32 might have been a bit overzealous, but I'm. it would have sucked to cut some of these, you know? So I'm glad we got to do this. Kiwi, thank you for putting this together, for uh, not only seeding everything, but like cutting half of these for us and putting it into the bracket of 32. Um, Kiwi's your guy for brackets, you know? And where can people check you out? Uh, I'm not sure, but it's fun that this... <laughs> <laughs> You're not on Instagram anymore, I guess, are you? I am on Instagram, okay. but it is fun that this recording session started with a home break-in. It's true. Yeah, if you are <laughs> if you watched my, my stream the day that this was being recorded, um, May 13th, Kiwi literally broke into my house. Yep. So, just show I thought, we, I thought we were recording this on the 14th. Oh no, I guess it was the 12th is when we started. It's the 13th now because we started yep. this at like 9 p.m. Jesus Christ. Oh my God. All right. Well, any, anything you want to plug at all, Kiwi? Or I've got nothing to plug. Okay. Just uh, just keep enjoying those regular Pat videos <laughs> and streams. That's yeah. my plug. Thanks. I make appearances on those. It's true. So. He does show up. So if you enjoyed Kiwi, get your Kiwi fix. Thank you to the 32 that made it here. I, I really appreciate the effort that went into this. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.